All right. So what I'm going to do is take this out here. Okay. Welcome to the College of Cobb Places. My name's Don, and I'm going to be the moderator this evening. Now, we have a very special speaker tonight, and his name is Andrew Roebuck. And he's going to be talking about the imminent collapse of the world economy and what you can and cannot do about it. Now, Andrew Roebuck is an officer with the United Trainmans Union, the UTU, Illinois Central Railroad, Matson Division. And he says there are two precipitating factors, overproduction and currency instabilities. His analyses are based on the careful study of Marxist and contemporary economics and observations of historical capital movements. Now, uh, I just want to say a few words about the College of Complexes. I think um, I, uh, there's a lot of people I see here who I recognize. There's, there's a lot of new faces as well. Uh, first of all, uh, the college, uh, like all colleges, charges the tuition. Uh, ours is very cheap. It's only $3 for the evening. And um, in addition, the restaurant will charge you uh, $5 plus tax, even if you order nothing. So you might as well get something to eat while you're here. Now, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to begin with some announcements about upcoming events and so forth in the community. And then we're going to have our speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Roebuck, who, whose uh, speech will last approximately an hour. Uh, after his speech is over, we'll have a question and answer session. And I would like to remind everyone here that the question and answer session is the time for questions and not for comments, OK? So any question you have must end with a question mark. Yes, Jeff? Oh, okay. So, um, now after our question and answer, answer session comes the infamous rebuttal period for which the College of Complexes is justly famous. During that time, anyone here in the restaurant can come right up to this podium, to the microphone, and make as big a fool out of themselves as five, they want for five minutes. Now, after the rebuttal period comes, uh, the speaker gets the final word, during which time he will get to rebut all the rebutters. Now, this restaurant closes at 11 p.m., Lincoln Restaurant, so we got to have the program over by then. Um, we don't have a whole lot of rules here at the College of Complexes. This is a freedom of speech forum, so you're pretty much free to say anything you want. However, we do have two rules. Number one is one fool at a time. So anyone who interrupts the person speaking will be reminded of the rule one fool at a time. They, and now, second rule. Oh, yeah, I'm hey. I'm scared. All right. I'm scared. Now, rule number two. That's the first question. And that goes for you too, Charlie. <laughs> All right. Now, number two. The number two rule is no personal attacks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And that. And, and by the way, that goes for you too, Charlie. Okay. David. <laughs> David. All right. Now, I just want to also mention that this is going on. This is going on video here. We have a video camera present tonight. Uh, if you if you don't, yeah, it is it is is my understanding is that these videos will not be transferred to the FBI or the Department of Homeland Security. They will so, be going on archive.org or YouTube. And, yeah, they will be going on archive.org or YouTube. Uh, if you don't want. If you don't want to be filmed, uh, just let oh, me know. Me. Oh, excuse me, please. One fool at a time, guys. Okay. Now, if now if you don't want to be videotaped, uh, obviously you could choose not to come up here to the podium where I am. You forgot uh, or, to mention that uh, the cameras on the waitress will dab you with some makeup if you think. Oh well, it, it's got to be careful then. Okay. Now. Um, all right, all right. Now let, I'll tell you what. Enough talk for me. Let's get on with the any, any more announcements. No. All right. Well, if there are no more announcements, then let's have a warm round of applause for our speaker, Andrew Roba. Presenting a Marxist point of view of our, how our economy develops. Closer to the mic. Hey. The Marxist point of view of a Marxist.
Marx's point of view of our economy is that all, all, the value of all commodities, the source of all value is labor. Labor is the source of all value. And the other one is that it's not overproduction, it's our inability to consume what we produce. There's a big difference there. We call it overproduction because we're producing more than what the market can consume. But it's actually our inability to consume what we produce is what causes uh, crises. <clears throat> I'd like to just start with a little, just a little, uh, for one thing, my, my, my speech is going to be very uh, superficial because to dwell on any of these subjects would take more than an hour to dwell on each of these subjects. But I'll try to go through the development of human society, which started, goes from tribalism to barbarism to feudalism into capitalism. And uh, what happened in tribalism, we're talking about production, and with tribalism, the whole tribe had to work hard to exist. In other words, they didn't have any commodities left over. They, they, were, they, they had a hard time uh, producing just enough to exist themselves to prevent starvation. But as technology developed, they had better hunting techniques. Maybe they developed bow and arrows or, or, or farming techniques. The tribes could produce more through technology than what they actually needed to maintain to, to survive. And this excess commodities allowed them to trade with other tribes. And that's how trade first developed. And uh, this trade, uh, this came in to be called the barter system, where everybody first, this trade developed more and more as, as human society developed through tribalism, the barbarism, and the feudalism, this, this trade developed into a marketplace. In the marketplace, people brought all their commodities in. The farmers would bring all their agricultural products in. The shoemakers would bring their products in. Everybody would bring their products into the marketplace, and they would trade for other products. And one of the products that was brought into the marketplace was gold. The gold, the gold, the people who would go and pan for gold and dig gold out of the streams, they'd bring those into the marketplace. And all these commodities that were brought into the marketplace had value because of the labor necessary to produce these commodities. And if I was a shoemaker, and it took me eight hours to make a pair of shoes, and I brought that into the marketplace, I'm going to be very careful to trade those shoes that took me eight hours of work to make sure that I get out of the marketplace something that took somebody else at least eight hours to produce. Because if I'm going to trade a pair of shoes, it costed me eight hours. And trade it to a farmer who gives me a dozen eggs and only took him two hours of labor to produce, I got screwed. So the marketplace made everybody, if you weren't a shrewd trader and educated and careful, you were bankrupted. You were just, you, you couldn't exist in the marketplace. So everybody learned to be careful about how they traded. And gold was one of the commodities traded. So if I'm going to trade a pair of shoes that took me eight hours, and the reason I want to buy gold is because if I trade it for, I can't trade a pair of shoes for three dozen eggs that are only going to last for four or five days without refrigeration or beef that's only going to last two days. I want to trade it for something today that I could store and bring back to the marketplace a week, two weeks, a month from now. And gold, gold fit the bill perfectly. It was a commodity that took labor to produce, the same amount of labor in gold that I would exchange my commodities for. So gold turned out to be, that's how gold and silver to some extent developed into money. That was our first money system, gold. And the difference between money and what we call money today is really currency is only a representation of gold. The currency that we use today is a representation of gold. It's not, it's, and, and uh, to a lesser extent, we used to, we coined, when we first started coining money, we coined gold and silver. And coined money is really a token, because when they first started coining money, they would coin a certain amount of gold or silver into the coin to use for trade. But as that coin was circulated, it lost sometimes 20 to 30% of its actual content through wear and tear. 
But people still accepted that coin at face value, even though the gold and silver content was less. So coinage is really a token. So coinage is a token, and then we go into the currency, which is a representation of gold. And today, currency still represents gold. Because why? Because we can buy gold with currency. And it, it, so currency has a value. The currency can lose its value quickly through manipulation of the amount of currency in circulation. But money can't. Money is a more stable value commodity. So anyhow, so that's, I wanted to talk about how uh, money and currency develop. And then capitalism developed through, went from feudalism, it went to merchant capitalism, where the merchant capitalist was the first capitalist on the scene. He bought and sold commodities. And then after that became industrial capitalism. And that's where factories developed. And we had an industrial capitalist system. And today we have a finance capitalist system, where finance runs the whole system. Wall Street and the banks run the world's economies today. So finance capitalism. Another thing I wanted to talk about was, I'm going to kind of jump around here a little bit, but um, how commodities get their value. And uh, the market sets the price of a commodity, but the commodity itself gets its value by the amount of labor embedded in the commodity. How much labor did it take to produce that commodity? That gives it its value. And the price of the commodity is determined by the market. So if the price is higher than the value, in other words, the value used to be considered as the cost of production, if the price is higher than the cost of production, there's going to be, there's going to be excess profit made from that. The capitalist is going to invest money into those sectors, produce more, and as more is produced, the price will fall down because the market sets the price. And then as the price falls down, money will be taken out of that sector and put into more uh, profitable sectors. But what I want to talk about is the value of commodities and how what we call why is it our why is there an inability to consume what we produce? We all know what depressions are. Nobody can buy nothing. Uh, uh, this Ford Motor Company can't sell their cars. The houses can't be sold. Uh, clothing stores are closing up. Now Best Buy just announced that they're uh, closing six, six of their stores in Chicago. So it's our inability to purchase what we produce that's causing the depression or the economic downturns, recessions. And I'm going to try to touch on that and explain to you how that is. <clears throat> The commodities get their value by the amount of labor embodied in the commodity. So the capitalist, in order to produce something, he buys commodities. He buys coal, he buys steel, he buys machinery, and he buys something called labor power. And when he buys labor power, he doesn't buy labor, he buys labor power. All these commodities are paid for before in order that for a commodity to be in existence, it has to be paid for. So these commodities, the capitalist buys. And the, he buys his labor power by the workers standing there and saying, I'm willing to work eight hours for you. So he, he, buy, he it, it's paid for in advance. Labor power is a commodity that's already paid for. And how is, it, how is labor power paid for in advance? Well, if I'm a worker and I go up to the boss and say, I'm willing to work for you for eight hours, my health, my ability to be alive, to, to be strong enough to do the labor, to, and to be educated enough to do that labor, and, and to be awake and fully clothed and healthy to do labor, <coughs> means there was an investment in my life from the beginning up until now. That means my labor power is paid for in advance. And I'm willing to sell my labor power to the capitalist. And he needs labor power to, in, in the mix of all the other commodities he buys. So all the other commodities, as he, as he consumes all these commodities, 
He consumes the coal or the electric or the energy. He consumes the machinery is consumed in the manufacturing process. Uh, the raw materials, the steel, the rubber, the, the, the components, they're all consumed. And as they're consumed, they produce the new commodity that the boss is making. But as he consumes labor power, it, all the other commodities, the value of those commodities are transferred one to one. In other words, if there's $100 worth of commodity investment, that $100 is transferred into the final product. Except labor power, as labor power is consumed, and that means it's turned into labor, it, the value of that is expanded. So now he pays me $100 for my labor power. But my labor power produces $120 worth of goods. And that's how the capitalist sells that $120 of goods on the market. He's selling it at its value. And he paid me at my value. As, as we know, as I explained earlier, commodities are, the, commodities are priced at the value of the cost of production, or the value, the value is set by the amount of labor embodied in it. <clears throat> So if, if I go there and I say, I can work for eight hours for you, it would, take, it would take the equivalent of six hours of labor to support my life for that day of work. That's how he can give me, he pays me for six hours because that's all eight hours of my labor power is worth because the value of the labor power is the same as the value of all the other commodities. <laughs> How much labor did it take to produce that commodity? So if it took six, if it took ten hours to produce a ton of ton of coal, mm -hmm. he takes that ton of coal and he transfers it into the commodity, the new commodity. It's the same six or ten hours transferred over. But if it took six hours to produce labor power, which is my commodity that I sell him, he can take he can pay me a fair value for my labor power because my labor power costs six hours of labor to produce for that day. So he pays me six hours, the equivalent of six hours labor. But as he uses me up, my labor, he gets eight hours of labor. That's how he makes his profit, because as he's consuming the commodity labor power, it expands in value. And it expands in value into the finished product. And as it expands in value in the finished product, the finished product has a higher value than all the commodities values combined that he put that he began with. And here's here's how we get to the point of our inability to consume what we produce. If he pays me the equivalent of six hours pay to produce eight hours worth of goods, then there's two hours worth of goods, this is called surplus surplus uh, products, on the market that can't be surplus value, that can't be consumed because on a whole system of production, if you're only paying, if you're only putting money into the market to buy these commodities of say $100, and you're selling into the market $110 worth of goods, or even $101 worth of goods, whatever it might be, you're, be, be, be pretty soon you see that if there's only $100 going into the market, and that $100 has to purchase $101 worth of goods, you're going to have $1 worth of goods left over that can't be purchased. And that is, called, that is what we call, a lot of people call overproduction, but it's, in reality, it's, it's an inability to consume what we produce. And we can say, which leads to another thing. A lot of people think that credit and money can be created out of thin air. A lot of people say that, oh, the reason we have a big economic crisis is because the banks gave too much credit to, uh, to homeowners to buy houses cheap. Or the banks let people buy on credit card. Everybody was buying everything on credit, got deep in debt, and now the crisis developed from too much credit. But in reality, Credit cannot be created from thin air. For one thing, if, 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 if I go to the bank and I say I need to borrow $100 or $100,000, whatever it is, to buy a house, the bank lends me the money and I give it to the, to the contractor. 
who's only getting his money back from that house, plus, of course, the profit that is expanded in the, in the building of the house. But he's getting his money back. So the credit wasn't created out of thin air, because if the bank lent me the $100, I gave it to the contractor. But the contractor is only getting his money back from, the, from his investment. And, either, and that happens the same thing with the, with, the, with the credit cards. You go to the store. And what it is is that the capitalist says, listen, I know you can't afford to buy. I know you ain't got no money. Just take this stuff. Just take it and pay me when you can. That's what credit is. Pay me when you can. So, okay, I'll take the house, the car, the new TV, and the, and the furniture and everything else. They give it to me, and I'll pay him back later. Because capitalist understands that, that he ain't got the money to pay it. So we get, in order to consume what we have already produced, we're extending, we're extending the, the inability into the future. Now, so we're keeping, we're, what we're doing is, in order to keep our economy going, we're getting deeper and deeper in debt. And, and this is, this, at some point, this debt is going to be unpayable. And that's when we're going to have the bankruptcies and the real financial crisis and the depressions. And it all stems because initially we're producing goods that can't be consumed. And, how, and, and you say, well, here's another example. We say, well, the warehouses, what happens, what they say what causes the depression is the warehouses are filled and the goods in the warehouses can't be sold. When the warehouse is filled, the capitalist cuts production. As he cuts production and lays employees off, they can buy less. So he has to cut production even more. It's the boom-bust cycle. If you look through the history of capitalism, from before the Civil War, we've had depressions in this country. We had worldwide depressions. And it's a boom-bust cycle. It works. <laughs> Microphone. I don't know how that thing works. Yeah, no. Anyhow, so it's a boom-bust cycle. Overproduction or producing what we can't consume, and then the bust. And the bust is a, a lot of when we cut production so low that the goods that are already in the marketplace can be consumed. Once, once those goods are consumed, then we can start the productive cycle again. But what we're at today is, as as you develop more and more and more in the marketplace, is as it is today, we went from uh, 2007, I remember we were like 4% unemployment, the economy was booming, and then the bottom fell out. We went from 4% to 9% unemployment, and we never, had, we never had a recovery, no recovery at all. And now we're on the verge of another recession, depression, or downturn. My opinion is that this recession that's, we're at the doorstep, if it's the same magnitude as the last one, we're going to be in this country 15% unemployment. Easy. Unof unofficial, probably 25. Because the high was 9.5, and, and the unofficial, I think, was 16 or 17% unemployment during the last depression. <laughs> but that's, that's the Marxist point of view of what causes depression. Inability to consume what we produce, and that is because in the, in the in the productive process, and it's not the capitalist is not cheating the worker at all. The capitalist has given him a val, a fair value price for his commodity, but as that commodity is consumed, it expands in value, and the capitalist ends up with a commodity that's higher valued than all the commodities he put into it. And when he goes to sell it, he can't sell it because there's not enough money placed back into the economy to buy it. Well anyhow, that's, that show, that's a theory on uh, the boom-bust cycle, that to, in a nutshell. You could, go, I go, you could go on and on and on on this theory of surplus value, but that's, that's it there. Very good. And, and when I have one other thing to talk about, uh, money, currency, and the problems we have with the worldwide debt crisis, which is going to explode here pretty soon. Uh, I could start just by saying that, uh, let's talk about Europe, which is, which is really a situation that's worldwide. Between 
between Spain and Greece, if, if Greece defaults, and especially if Spain defaults, which I, from what I read, Spain will leave the Eurozone before Greece, but if Spain defaults, the banks in Europe are bankrupt. So the governments in the European Central Bank has a choice, either bail out Spain or allow Spain to default, and then they're going to have to bail out the banks. But no matter how you look at it, these, these debts won't, are not going to be paid, period. They can't be paid, they won't be paid. And if they bail out, if the European governments start bailing out the banks or the, or the, or the individual governments, the way they're going to have to do it is to just print money to no abandon. <laughs> and, and when that happens, we're going to see a tremendous amount of inflation. Because it, and you're going to see the prices of everything <coughs> skyrocket. And we got a little, little uh, uh, pre-sight of that with this here gasoline price spiking like it did. But that's small potatoes compared to what's going to happen when the economic crisis hits. Uh, in my opinion, uh, I don't see how they can hold out much more in a year or two. Uh, in in uh, Europe, the big, the big problem is Japan. Japan is 200% of their GDP in debt. They're in debt the equivalent of 200% of GDP. No way for them to pay. We got, we're 16 trillion in debt. No way for the United States government to repay that. If interest rates go up, interest, I think they're paying an average of 2 or 3% interest. If interest rate, for every 1% interest rates go up, the United States government has to pay another $160 billion a year to roll the debt over. If, so if the Federal Reserve were to allow interest rates to reach a normal level, interest rates would be 4 to 6 to 7 percent. Our government wouldn't be able to pay the interest on the national debt. Right. So the Federal Reserve has to keep interest rates down. That means they have to constantly buy treasuries. And they're buying it either outright or they're lending money to the banks at one quarter percent. And the banks turn around and buy the federal debt at 2 percent. But that, that works as long as it works. But at some point, it, you know, this here, this here thing is going is, is gonna to reach its end. And that's when, when we either fail, can't roll over to debt. When that happens, that's going to be when all hell breaks loose. Amen. Yeah. So as long as they can keep rolling over to debt. And the way they're rolling over to debt today is, I think, the Federal Reserve is lending the banks money at one quarter percent. The banks are buying the Treasury bonds at two percent. So the banks, all the banks seem to be in fine economic shape because they're borrowing at one and lending at two. But like I say, at some point, that ain't gonna, that's going to have to come to an end. So I don't know. I think I just, uh, very, I think I covered what I wanted to say. Let me see here. What can and can we do about it? Well, 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 let's, let's save well, questions for after okay. the lecture. Yeah, well, let me say, I want to say one other thing. Uh, what, can we, what can and can we not do about it? Basically, <clears throat> we're all part of this society. We're all going to have to roll with the flow, whether we like it or not. That's, you know, and uh, individually, if we anticipate inflation in the future, we would have to buy things that will protect us from inflation. The most commonly acknowledged uh, investment is, is, is precious metals or possibly real estate. And there's certain, if you know how to invest in stocks, there might be some stocks that will rise with the rate of inflation. Other stocks are going to collapse in inflation. You know, I wouldn't know how to, how to do that. But it seems to me that uh, if, you're, if you anticipate inflation, precious metals is the place to be. But like I say, it's just an opinion, my own personal opinion, not uh, an advice to anybody. Uh, um. huh? So what can we do? What can we do? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm just about done, I guess. Actually, the title of the the title that's in the paper was conjured up by my good friend Joe, my stepfather. So I don't know what we can do about it, to tell you the truth. I, I know that there's a crisis coming. 
and how it's going to affect each and every one of us will be different. And what we can do about it, well, I don't know what to tell you, but it's, there's a crisis coming. There's an economic crisis, and the economic crisis that's coming is due to our inability to consume what we produce. We're going to hit, in my opinion, 15% or plus unemployment, and when that happens, all government revenues across the board are going to be reduced. So California, Arizona, New Jersey, and Illinois are all going to see tremendous financial crisis when their revenues are reduced. And uh, is the United States government going to allow these states to go bankrupt? I don't know. But if the states go bankrupt, the pension funds are all bankrupt because they they own most of the state bonds. Mm -hmm. and, then this, uh, uh, and then also banks own all these bonds. Are we going to allow the banks to go bankrupt? So the government, has to, if the banking system collapses, we're all done, period. That's it. That's the end of everything. So the governments, all governments, have to support their banking system. They can't allow them to collapse. So what our government is going to do is, are they going to bail out the states when they go bankrupt in order to keep the banks from going bankrupt? Or are they going to let the states, so states go bankrupt, which I think they possibly will because that will sa save them the problems of, of, of uh, all these problems with pension funds and everything. They're not going to be solved. They're just going to be, I don't know how to say it, a catastrophe is going to happen. But I think... I don't know what to think. If they let the states go bankrupt, the banks go bankrupt, pension funds go bankrupt. If they bail out the states, where, how's the government, how's the federal government going to bail anybody out? It's bankrupt. So, my opinion is, it's a printing press, it's the only thing, the only viable alternative, and I, I believe that's in score. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, wait, 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 I kind of think so. Okay, all right. Let's okay. have a warm round of applause. Okay, now we'll get on with the question and answer session. You know, don't go away. Stay here. Stay here. Yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get on with the question and answer session. Now, first of all, well, I just want to remind everybody again that the uh, questions must end with a question mark. Also, if you have a question, just, just raise your hand and I'll call on you, okay? And no matter what some people might think, I, I do call on everybody, okay? I don't play favorites. All right. Now, uh, okay, who's got a question? Gene, go ahead. Uh, would, with your analysis, would it make any difference whatsoever if we only had individual intra entrepreneurships? In other words, we didn't have corporations or or uh, other uh, group uh, uh, groups like that, partnerships and so on. You just had individuals who did uh, had their own businesses. Would that make any difference? Well, as capitalism developed and industrial capitalism developed. Each individual capitalist was in charge of his small workshop or factory. And he was right there. He was part of production. He was right there and he watched that guy work the machine or that guy was doing his job and he was out there and he was writing the books and he was doing all the work. He was part of production. He was a, he was a productive part of society. The small individual businessman or small capitalist. Today, it's all Wall Street and stock. You invest in stocks, you invest in Wall Street, you don't care how the hell that, country, that company is run, and you've got no idea how it's run, as long as you get a return on your investment. And this allows the, this allows the managers to write their own ticket, because they know the people who own the country, the company, don't have any idea how to run it. So the, the stock investors are at the mercy of the managers who write themselves now, these managers are getting where they used to get like 10 times the average salary, now they're up to 100 times or 1,000 times or who knows how much. But to answer your question, it, we would, in order to do what you're suggesting, it is going backwards. We're, to go backwards, we can't go backwards. We're in a, we're in a, a period of production, it's called the period of, it's called the theory of diminished returns. In other words, the corporations have to get bigger and bigger and bigger and produce more and more and more because the amount of profit per unit keeps shrinking. Because the whole idea of the capitalist is to lower production costs. As he lowers production costs, he also lowers his profit margin. 
That's why Henry Ford, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but Henry Ford could make 100,000 cars and make millions of dollars, and Ford Motor Company today can make 10 million cars and go bankrupt. Because the amount, the amount of profit per unit keeps shrinking, the corporations have to get bigger and bigger and bigger to compete. All right, I hope uh, I answered that question. All right, thank you. Uh, Brown. Yes. My grandfather was a... Uh, <coughs> A speculator in, in land, and he owned a lot of land. If uh, you have a depression, your land values go way down. Uh, it, would it be one way to rescue uh, the uh, the Commonwealth, uh, the governments, uh, uh, by leveling? Tax, laying taxes on, on land. Are you saying there might be a, a solution to our economic crisis by taxing land? land value. A, a, you mean a, like a property tax? When we have a property tax. Yes. And, and if, the, if the taxes keep going up, people will be forced out of their homes. Uh, I mean, to me, uh, Property taxes is 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 a, is a good tax. There's nothing wrong with property tax, but if if you're talking about the small homeowner, uh, if you keep raising his property taxes, you, you're going to push him right out of his house. So I don't know, and I don't know that really raising taxes in that way is going to solve the problem. The only the only solution to this problem is if we could go back to three percent unemployment. Where, where the economy was booming again, then revenue would be pouring in. People would be, everybody would be working. We'd have happy, we'd have the war in twenties all over again. My opinion is that that's not in the cards. And uh, and <laughs> raising taxes on property or land, I don't see how that would solve anything. Uh, my own opinion is that we should raise income taxes. I, personally, I believe. Corporate taxes should be zero or very low, what? and where we should get the money is not tax the corporation because we want the corporations to have a lot of money to reinvest in plant and machinery and everything. That's how it works. But, but we want, what we want is, but when they make that, when they take that profit, if they're not going to reinvest it in the corporation and they're going to pass it off as a dividend, that's where we should hit them. The dividend, the profit, the income tax of the wealthy is where we should concentrate. Tax increases. Right. That's one food at a time, please. Okay. Did I? Why am I listening? Okay. All right, uh, Charlie, you had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. Oh yeah, Andy. What about? I've got a solution. Nationalize the essential industries of this nation. Just see your railroad man, just like see it, uh, Conrail, and we did to the automobile factories. And why don't we do that to the banks, like we want a state bank here in Illinois? And then, then that surplus profit goes where it goes to the to the producer or the power, the laborer. Well, I don't know, I don't know that that would be a solution to nationalize the bank. But I can tell you, we had an opportunity to nationalize the banks when we had the crisis in right. 2008, and they didn't nationalize the banks. They gave the money to the banks. Yeah, they bailed them out. So we had an opportunity to nationalize the banks. Now, whether that would solve the crisis. I don't know, but I, I will give you an idea of what I think would solve the crisis. And, and this is if the capitalist gives his goods away. That's the only way. Forgiveness of debt is is how it has to come about. He has to give he has to give his excess goods away that he can't sell. He has to give them away. If you owe all this money to, for everything, he has to say, "Listen, keep the car, keep the TV, keep the house." Keep everything. And then that vacation you took to wherever it was, forget it. It's all yours. I'm the house. That's how you would get us out of this situation. Forgiveness of debt, which is not because it ain't going to happen. That's all I can tell you. It ain't going to happen. But that's how you solve That is my opinion of how we solve this crisis we're in. All right. Uh, sir, you had your hand up? You yes. To uh, what, what about... Um, reigning in the spending. The reason we got to this 11 trillion in debt that we're at now, forget the other 5 trillion that's, uh, that we owe to ourselves in Social Security and Medicare, 
but we went from five trillion in 2008 of of uh, federal debt. We added six trillion in four years. Now, what about the novel idea of cutting our sp federal spending and instead and just you know for until we can get out of this mess, you know, just start cutting our spending so we can start paying down this debt. I have no government. Yeah. Okay. Let everybody die. 48, 48 cents of every dollar the United States government spends, 48 cents is borrowed. These Republicans are talking about cutting the uh, deficit from 1.6 trillion to 1 trillion for the next 20 years, I think. So they're talking about still adding a these Republicans who want to cut the debt are still talking about adding a trillion dollars of debt to our, to our debt load every year for the next 10 or 20 years or however far in the future it is. So you can cut, how, how can you cut 48 cents out of the federal budget to have you a have to budget? Cut, you have to cut a trillion dollars a year to make it work. You can't do the 20 year thing, yeah. it'll still bankrupt okay. you. Here's, here's my theory on that. Why is it that the government can borrow, they, they say, oh, uh, the theory is that if we raise taxes, oh, it'll hurt the economy, oh, it'll hurt this and that. We can't raise taxes, especially on the poor rich people. So uh, uh, why is it that we can borrow trillions of dollars from the wealthy, and we're taking their money, and we're giving them an IOU in exchange, why is it we can take their money that way, and everything is okay, but we can't take their money through taxes? We should just, if all this money that we're borrowing from the wealthy shouldn't be borrowed at all, it should be taxed away from them. And it wouldn't hurt the economy one bit. It wouldn't hurt the economy one bit. Because I'll tell you why. I'll tell you what. If the government's, here you got the guy, he's got a trillion dollars. Either he spends it on, if he's a wealthy person, he's going to buy a fancy uh, Florida uh, Mansion on the on the coast, they cost thirty or forty million, or however much they spend for him, or who knows what, or who knows what he's going to spend his money on. Elevators for his car. Yeah, security. Yeah, that's right. So he's going to. So I hate security. I'm, not saying, I'm sorry, but he's going to take the money. He can't spend. So wait, wait, wait. One fool at a time, y'all. If he if if he has the money, he's going to spend it on his own luxurious items. If I tax him and take the money, and I spend it on, let's just say we spend it on support for poor people. And, and they buy food, and they buy clothing, or they buy whatever they buy. The, the, the balance to the economy is zero. Because either if the wealthy get to keep their money, they'll spend it on Cadillacs, mansions, and who knows what. You know what I mean? But if we take it away from them, and the government distributes it to the poor people, they'll buy. And we could do the same thing with raising wages, too. If we raised wages, that would cut the profits of the wealthy. But it wouldn't affect the overall economy, because now the workers would have more money to spend. They'd be able to buy a TV set instead of buying it on credit. But it would also take away the profit from the from the from the capitalist who spends it on. In other words, there'd be more Chevys bought and less Cadillacs bought. That's the way I look at it. It's, so, okay. <clears throat> uh, Sid, you had your hand up. Yeah. Do you have any understanding of Marxist dialectics? I read book. I read books on it. Yeah. Uh, for instance, in uh, Russia, USSR, they only had 14,000 members of the Bolsheviks. But yet, they, only, they had a revolution with 14,000. And what they call that under Marxism is a quantity into quality. And in the United States, the scientists are now saying we got punctuated equilibrium. In other words, things build up to a certain point, and then a revolution happens. Like if you take, a, for instance, a, a donkey, and you put a lot of uh, straw on his back, and you put one more straw on the back, and it goes down. Question. Well, that's that's the question. Did you know any, Did you know anything about it? I read a lot about dialectics. Yes, okay. and I understand that uh, what you're asking me is, do I do I think if things get bad enough, is there a possibility of a revolution in this yeah. country? Yeah, yeah. My opinion on that is, if things get bad enough, and you can look in all places, Syria, Egypt, Egypt didn't have a revolution, they just changed the face of the government. Because the military ran the government before Mubarak, while Mubarak was there, and the military still runs it. So there was just a, 
a change of scenery, but the government is still the same. So it wasn't a revolution. But uh, if things get bad enough, it, it brings out a revolutionary epoch. In other words, that means the, the society is ripe for revolution. Now, in order for revolution to be successful, you have to have qualitative elements. Yeah. A revolutionary party, a working class is right, willing right, to right. sacrifice. Uh, are those and, uh, and, and a working class that's educated and, and, and all these other things? Are those present, or will those things develop? That's something I don't know. And we'll, there's a lot of forces at work to prevent that. A lot of forces at work that are going to be unstoppable. So we have to wait and see what happens. But that's something we we'll all just have to wait to see how things develop. Just, I wouldn't make a prediction on that. All right. Um, all right, sir. You you had a question? Yeah. Um, they just missed a wonderful opportunity to go into a controlled deflation. Have you ever heard of the word deflation? Yes. <laughs> when you have inflation, you've got to okay, have okay. deflation. All right. And this, now, sir, you have to now, have, this has got to be a question. Okay, now, 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 to, I got a for General Motors, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, insurance companies, they spend a lot of money. If they spend that correctly, yeah. They could have brought the economy now, you know. All right. All right. But, but all they've learned to do is from money. All right. Sir, what's your question? That was not a question. The answer to what he said. Why haven't they gone into a deflation? I'll tell you why. Here's an opinion. Uh, when, when, the, when the economy slows down and things can't be sold, the prices drop. The prices drop because the market sets the price. If nobody's buying, the price keeps falling until somebody's going to buy. But what happened, we didn't see a deflation in this last slowdown, because, in my opinion, because the United States government pumped a lot of money into our economy. Right. And, and what we see as under, if, if that didn't happen, we, we possibly would have had a deflation, a serious deflation. But, wait, wait, sir, sir. But they, did, they prevented, the government, the Federal Reserve, and the United States government prevented deflation by bailing out banks, bailing out the GM, <clears throat> making it, uh, doing all these other economic things to pump money into society. But you're saying that wasn't Wait, wait, enough. listen. Okay. Well, 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 here's the point. Wait a second. The, 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 when we talk about inflation, deflation, <clears throat> if we're in an inflationary period or a deflationary period, it's not going to affect the production. Because if you put more money into society, prices will go up. But it's not going to affect the amount of goods being produced and the amount of commodities being circulated. All right. In other words, the commodities being circulated control the financial aspects of the economy. So you can cause inflation, you can cause deflation, but you can't cause increased production simply by either increasing the money supply or allowing the money supply to decrease. All right, now, all right, now well, Walter's had his hand up for a while. Go ahead, Walter. Oh, man, I'm <laughs> okay, did you have a question, Walter? Yes, yeah. I do. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had my hand up. On okay. Speak, Walter, speak. <laughs> I will. Uh, as our country flounders along, I think more and more of that thing that Wall Street calls protectionism. If we had the high tariffs and we put this country back on a good, healthy manufacturing basis again, yeah. with the millions of more people paying taxes, the government getting more to spend on infrastructure, wouldn't that pull us <coughs> out of our mess that we're in? Do you, what's your opinion on that? Well, General, General Electric just built a big factory in Louisville, Kentucky. And they're gonna, I think they're going to start manufacturing refrigerators there. And they're talking about bringing production back to this country, refrigerators and some other GE things. And it's a big factory. It's a big thing. We're reinvesting money in this country. And why? Because wages are low. They can, in, in Kentucky and other places, you can get good quality labor at a very low price, which gives us a more competitive uh, position against low-cost wage countries. Tariffs... I don't know if tariffs will do any good, because uh, that's a question I really don't know. Uh, I'm not in favor of tariffs, although I look at China and I see the way I see the way China is is uh, they have slave labor, almost slave labor in China, 
and they, 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 get, they, they give us garbage, and people buy it. It's sad. You hear that? Uh, the, 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 the quality of their machinery, and CTA just had, has to redo all their brand new CTA cars. Canadian company. What are the Chinese? Right, yes, but the, part, the time, but the yeah, part was made in China. The, the part Bombardier has to replace was made in China. That's the problem. And we could look, they poisoned our toothpaste, they poisoned our wallboard. Uh, I mean, uh, oh, if you yeah. buy tilapia or catfish Boys. from China, be careful because it, they, they grow them in sewer. Sewer water is what they're they're growing in there. So, uh, but oh, yeah. sheriffs, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, yeah. All right, all right, uh, Frank, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, I think that it's a very uh, very clear presentation that the capitalist system, as it is, is not sustainable. Because if we have to increase our production to be able to maintain the system working, this is a finite world where you increase <coughs> the consumption, the production and the consumption, you start, you start consuming your resources to the point that there is no more. So this is a dead end. This system is not going to work, whether we save it now or later. Is that your opinion? Well, I can say this. Uh, if we if we look at what's going on in the world today, we're just dest <coughs> destroying the Amazon rainforests, uh, and a lot of people don't believe in global warming. I I believe that if you put a gazillion tons of carbon in the atmosphere, it's going to have an effect. It it has to have an effect. Everything we do has an effect, a cause and effect. Now, what that effect is going to be, most sci a lot of scientists believe it's going to bring on a global warming. I agree with that. But we're destroying the rainforests. Uh, we're causing earthquakes now with the fracting for natural for gas. I mean, uh, um, environmentally, we're we're, yeah, we're 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 dirty in our nest. We're, we're doing a bit, we're, we're not doing a good job of, of taking care of what we have. Uh, is it is is it sustainable? Well, like I, like I said before, we're going to go into if we go into a revolutionary epoch, and capitalism is allowed to sustain itself through that grim period, huh. it could rebuild itself. It doesn't mean that it's going to come to an end. And if it, if it, if it regains momentum, we could go through more periods. But we have, there's so many things staring at us. We have nuclear war, uh, and even just regular wars. Uh, it's, it's not, I don't, looking forward, I, I see it's, uh, I don't see a lot of, uh, positive things uh, going forward. That's just my opinion. All right, uh, sir, you had your hand up for a young question. Yeah, your statement that it's a wash giving the money to the rich. You really believe that the the, the, the hundreds, of billions, and trillions of dollars these people have, they're spending, and they're not just taking out of the economy, the world economy, and destroying it. Yeah. Oh no, I didn't say that. My point was. You said it was a wash. As far as production is concerned, not, not, not. Uh, you, here's what happens when we go into a crisis. The government has to decide who's going to who's going to bear the burden of this crisis. That's the thing. They're not going to prevent the crisis, but they have an ability to decide who's going to who's going to bear the burden of this crisis. And there are certain elements who want the poor and the working class to bear the price. They want to cut all welfare. All wages, all pensions, all everything, so that the poor people in the working class bear 100 percent of the burden, and the wealthy can just skate by and say, "Oh, this is terrible. This is just simply terrible." But the other thing is, we could go after, we could take and hit the wealthy, and take and tax them, and make them bear the burden of this crisis that's yes. coming. They're not going to bear the burden. I understand that, but that's I, I agree with you. We're going to spend but the money. Here's the point. Here's the point. Right. Right. The point is. Wait, let me say one thing. The point is. The point is, if we tax, take their money and tax them, and, and the government spends it on, on social programs, or if they spend it on themselves, as far as production is concerned, the productive wealth will be producing more yachts, more Cadillacs, more mansions, and less 
uh, consumable goods all that right. uh, oh. average working class people. All right, all right. Uh, now, now I just want to say, them. all right. Now, just hold on. Before any, before I answer, uh, before I call on anybody else, I just want to remind everybody uh, once again that uh, we have a rebuttal period, and if you think that, that our speaker is full of it, and you and you want to tell the whole audience that. You will get your opportunity to do so during the rebuttal period. So you don't have to start an arg uh, you don't have to start an argument with him here. You just ask your question, hear him answer, and then during the rebuttal period, then you can get up here and tell and tell everybody that the speaker's full of crap. You're full. Okay. Gene, go ahead. <laughs> Gene, you have a question. Yeah, uh, this is a challenge to what you stated. Uh, my grades weren't that good in economics. But I remember the chapter on money and banking. And maybe you can help with, <coughs> with my full scholarship by telling me the difference between what you said. You said they don't create money out of nothing. And I thought when the bank in this book said if you put up 10, the bank could lend 100. Mm -hmm. Well, the bank only got 10 here. What did the other 90 come from? To me, that's taking money, creating it out of nothing. But actually, what you're talking about is fractional banking. Right. And fractional banking is where the bank, but here, here's, here's why I say money and credit cannot be created out of thin air. A lot of people think that the banking industry, through fractional banking, is creating all this money out of nowhere. But if here's how fractional banking works. They lend the same money out over and over and over again. But what they're actually facilitating is the circulation of money. And there's... To match that circulation of the money, you also have circulation of commodities. Uh, if I have a house and, and, and you want to buy the house from me, you go to the bank and you borrow $100,000 from the bank and you buy the house from me. But when you give me that $100,000, I'm getting my money back because I put, put $90,000 into the house. So you're giving me the $100,000 and, and, and it didn't create that $100,000. Nothing was created out of thin air because now I have my money back that I already put into the house. Now I take that money and put it back in the bank, and but now according to the banking regulations, they have to keep like two or three or five or six percent of that money in reserve to, to satisfy the banking regulations. Now they're gonna lend that money out again. They're gonna lend it to somebody else to buy, three people come in and wanna buy Lexus, three Lexuses. They, so they lend the 90,000 of those three people. But when they buy those Lexuses, they're given Whatever, who makes Lexus? Toyota? Is it who makes Lexus? Okay, they're giving Toyota their money. But Toyota already invested that money in those cars. Toyota's getting their money back out of the system that they already put in. So there's no money being created by fractional banking. Now I put that money, now, those, now the Toyota dealer puts that money back in the bank. 90000 So the bank has to keep 5000 in reserves. they got 85000 to lend out. They lend it to somebody who wants to buy all kinds of new furniture, and who knows what for their house. But they're spending it. When they spend it, they're giving it back to somebody who already invested that money, and they're getting their money back. So there's no money being created out of thin air. What is happening is the banks are facilitating the circulation of money. And, and, but a lot of people think that, and they write that, they say that fractional banking is creating all this money out of thin air, and this credit is being created out of thin air. But you can't. If you're going to buy something on credit, like I said, boy, the boss has a, a car. He says, he says, I'd like to buy that car, but I don't have no money. The boss says, listen, take the car. Just take it and pay me when you can because I need to sell the, the, the thing. You know what I mean? So he takes the car, and I'll, I, you bought it on credit. But th that wasn't created out of thin air because the car company paid for that car. It wouldn't be in existence if it wasn't paid for first. So credit, when we see all this credit being created out of thin air, what it really is, is the companies, the capitalists, the boss, the owners are giving you the goods and saying, pay me when you can. But those goods are already paid for. Because if they weren't paid for, they wouldn't be in existence. I can't own them to give to you unless I paid for them. So there's no, crea there's no creation of credit or money out of thin air. All right, Bernie Kahana, go ahead. Okay, you talked about uh, the loan forgiveness, wholesale loan forgiveness is a way to maybe normalize things. And I believe you also mentioned it's not going to happen. And could you comment on the fact that we have 
a seeming record number of bankruptcies taking place, and um, also a lot of instances of people just aren't paying their debts, or they're getting forgiven anyway. Uh, it was on the news the other day that uh, you might get a 1099 in the mail for a debt forgiveness, and apparently this has happened quite a bit. Is, is there, did you have a question, Bernie? That's yeah. a question. Could you comment? Um, okay. Uh, With all the bankruptcies that we have in this country, it's not making a dent. That shows you how much people are in debt. All these bankruptcies, and, and, and if, I think, I don't know what the rate of bankruptcies are, but when you borrow money to buy a commodity, you've got to pay interest. And the bankruptcies aren't even, aren't even getting past the interest that's on this debt, system-wide. So there, these bankruptcies, if you, and here's the problem. Yeah, forgiveness of debt would allow a normalization, but you remember, forgiveness of debt also means a person who's forgiven a debt is losing, it has to give up that money. And that could cause <laughs> bankruptcies of its own. You know, if you don't go bankrupt and don't pay me, if I just forgive your debt, I might be the one who's bankrupt. But the forgiveness of debt is what will allow us to start over. It will, it will solve our problem today. Now, if we keep the same system, that's the problem. In so many years down the road, the problems will be right there again. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I interrupt well, you? No, I'm done. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, did you have a question? The Occupy Movement, will that help? solve this problem? I would have to say uh, the banks are, the banking, the bankers in this country and the banks have really, in my opinion, they should be, uh, there should be criminal prosecution on a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, If the Occupy Wall Street movement were to facilitate that type of a thing, it happened, fine. Uh, I don't really know too much about the goals of the Occupy Wall Street movement, but I know they're they're trying to bring to light uh, what the banks and Wall Street are doing. They're 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 really, in my opinion, and not all. You know, there are a lot of honest, good businessmen in this country. I don't want to paint, paint them all black or, or you know, paint them all dishonest. But you could look at what's going on. There, a lot of these business interests in this country are raping the country. That's it. Uh, that's my opinion. So, and, and uh, I think the Wall, the Wall Street Occupy thing is trying to bring those issues to light. So I, I'm, in, I'm more or less in favor of them, yeah. All right. Oh, Wesley, did you have a question? Yeah. I want to just try uh, when, you, when you order food, you place an order, and when you get the food, you get the bill. So you get the title. When you ask for a loan, the banks are obligated to use the standards that the banks have. They cannot loan any of their assets, correct? They can't loan any of their assets. They can only loan when you sign the dotted line. So your signature is where the money comes. Yeah, but your your loan is an asset on the bank balance sheet. Your loan is a, I believe that's an asset. So so when you get the loan, you should get a title. No, it doesn't work that way because when you get a loan on an automobile, they hold the title away from you. When you get a loan on an automobile, you don't get the title. The, whoever lent you the money gets the title on the car. So somebody owns that car. It's what's paid for. My question is. The banks, are, they can't loan any of their assets. Is that true? I don't, I don't, I, I, what? Based no. on the banking codes, yes, because they're not supposed to loan any of their assets. No, I don't know that that's true or not, because when you put money, okay, you, uh, let me say this. If you're, if you're a depositor in a bank, you become a, uh, hey, what's the opposite of an asset? That's uh, what you do. Liability. That's it. You become a liability. That's the word. So when you put money into a bank account, you're a liability to the bank. And the asset is the money that the bank is holding for you. Now, when they take the money that they're holding for you and lend it out on an automobile or a home, they hold the title for that automobile or a home 
as an asset. Do they have the right to loan your money to somebody else? Yes, absolutely. Yes. That's how the bank is. So they loaned your asset to somebody. They didn't. They didn't loan that. Like they no. didn't loan any of That's assets. exactly right. Okay. And right. and the other way they get you the money. You see what a problem is. Okay. Well, that's how the bank facilitates the circulation of money, and that's why they're criminals. Well, there might be some criminal activity, but simply loaning out depositors' money is the standard operating procedure of a bank. And they, they give you 2% and they charge him 6%. That's how they make the money, being the middleman. All right. Uh, Bill, do you have a question? Yeah, are you at all familiar with the reinvestment and cost-cutting measures taken by the Florida East Coast Railroad? In the 1960s? No, I'm not. I'm familiar with the Florida East Coast Railroad in some ways. I think they're part of the CSXT now. Okay. But okay. that's all I know about the all Florida right. East Coast Railroad. Okay. <laughs> all right, let's go on. Now, uh, excuse me, ma'am, but wait in the back there. Did you have a question? Yeah. I, oh, thank you. So I was wondering, um, I saw in the paper that you are an um, officer in the United Trainmen's Union? Yeah, not no more. As of January, I, I gave up the office. Gotcha. Well, I was just wondering how much you feel like the trade union movement in North America and generally embraces these, you know, embraces sort of the position that you laid out in terms of the surplus value of labor, but how does that inform bargaining? How does that inform international solidarity? How do you think that in your experience in the trade union movement here in North America, like these global realities about the economy were sort of broken down on a level that people in their day-to-day -day work lives related to. My opinion on trade unions are that they're not, they don't agree, I don't say they disagree with what I say, but they don't expose what I say. And most of the trade unions are support the Democratic Party. And the reason is that they feel that the Democratic Party will give them more and bigger crumbs off the table than the Republican Party will. And, and, and uh, that's my opinion. And um, they, the unions in this country, they do a good job fighting against some severe odds to maintain uh, standards of living and decent uh, uh, workplace conditions for their employees. Without it, without unions, whether you know, I have my own criticisms of the union movement and the unions, but I also understand that they, without them, we would have, we would really be in extremely bad shape. Okay. Can I just uh, ask one follow-up? Sure. Wait, wait. Uh, Better ask one more. Oh, actually, oh, my yeah. question was, did you feel like your experience in the trade union movement had any bearing, any relevancy to what you just discussed tonight? Oh, uh, I can see <laughs> firsthand how my theories are uh, uh, work in reality. Yes, I absolutely. Yeah. All right. I, uh, Tim, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I keep hearing a lot about the boom and bust cycle of capitalism. I keep hearing a lot about an accurate overall description, yet I have yet to hear what your solution is to the boom-bust problem. Can you elaborate, please? Well, if, if, if the boom-bust is uh, part and parcel to capitalism. That's it. Uh, you're not going to have capitalism because you can't have capitalism without uh, producing. As long as a capitalist makes a profit, and he makes a profit by producing more than can be consumed in the marketplace, you're going to have the boom-bust cycle. And now, that has been the object of economists and politicians from the 1600s to today, is try to eliminate the boom-bust cycle from our economy. Mm -hmm. And we have these uh, people who advocate gold standards and uh, uh, all different types of... Uh, uh, economic theories, but as long as you have capitalism, you're going to have the boom bust cycle. It's well, it's it, but but I mean, the, the, you see it in nature with predator prey, with the relations between them. One goes up, the other goes down. One goes up, well, the other you goes know, down. Capitalism, and it's a, well, China, it's China, 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 capitalism is part of the development of our human society. Right. <laughs> and and it's it's not something apart from us. It's, right. it's part of our development. It's it's and, and if you want to equate it to other parts of nature, fine. It it's all part of development. 
Right. It's all part of evolution. It's all, all right. Part. <laughs> all right. Now, Good. I see. I want to just. Uh, there's some people who have their hands up who have already had a question. So before we go to those people, I want to ask uh, everyone here: Is there anyone here who has a question who has not already asked a question? Well, Anyone? Fair. Okay. No? Well, I have a couple oh. of questions now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. First of all, okay. First off, um, I, you mentioned, well, they're kind of related. So it's really sort of like a single double question. My, my question is, if you're talking about the economy, I just wanted to ask you about inflation, if you could explain what, you know, uh, uh, to, to the audience, what, I mean, what in your opinion create causes creates inflation, and also, you know, also the phenomenon of hyperinflation, whether this, is this a special <coughs> phenomenon, or is this essentially more of the same thing as regular inflation, and also, also, um, what do you think the prospects are for, uh, for the United States experiencing hyperinflation? Uh, that's, that's my question. Right. Hyper, hyperinflation, if we want to look at Germany in the 20s, I mean, they were having I think their inflation rate was in the billions, the billions of percent from the time it started to the time it ended. It, 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 that's hyperinflation. Are we gonna, is that in store for us? Only time will tell. Inflation, I believe inflation is already baked into the cake. Yep. Now, how, how much, how bad, when, that's, we're having to wait and see it because they're, the politicians worldwide are doing an excellent job of maintaining the situation and keeping the staff kicking the can down the road. How long can they kick that can down the road? That's the question. Hyperinflation? I don't know. I think I would say I feel very confident mucho inflation is uh, is in the fight. <laughs> but we'll just have to wait and see. Because and I'll tell you why, because also inflation allows the government to pay their debts. If we had 100% inflation, that would make the, the relative debt of the United States government 50% what it is today. Good. Cool. So uh, inflation helps helps cool. the debtor. But who we, who we owe the money to, those are the people who are going to be hurting from inflation. So I, I believe infl inflation is baked into the cake exactly. How much we'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, what, I think we've got time for a second round of questions. So, Charlie, go ahead. Yeah, and the... Uh, I'm going to Washington next week to, to get the United States government to build a New York to Chicago high-speed railroad. If you were Senator Andy, what would you tell me? Or should I sell shares to my pals here at the college? Is the government going to build this railroad and create jobs and yeah, well, to the infrastructure? We can stimulate the economy. All right. What, what we have... The, the government is really, the government and its laws are the result of social forces. And we can analyze all the laws that are passed in, in the federal and state uh, legislatures as a result of these social forces, a tug of war between all these different social forces. High speed rail, European style interrail system, 100% for it. But there's people in this country who think that it would be a waste of taxpayers' money. Uh, I know uh, probably the automobile industry and the gasoline industry, they're opposed to it because they like this idea that we, we're the most wasteful country in the world in our transportation system. We, it, 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 it's astounding how wasteful we are. Everybody has their own automobiles, and we, if you want to take a bus, you've got to wait a half an hour or 45 minutes, and if you get on the bus, what, there's 10, 12 people on there. Everybody's, you know... Not counting rush hour traffic, you know what I mean? But our transportation system is terrible. We got Amtrak in this country. What do they run? One, uh, two, three trains, uh, one train a, a day this way and that way. It's not like Europe. I'm a 100% favor of a more comprehensive transportation system. I'd be in favor of raising gas taxes quite a bit to support right. that. But when you talk about raising gasoline taxes, it's to, 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 if you raise gasoline taxes, the person who's driving a car would actually benefit because less people would be on the road for him to have to fight with on the way to work. He'd actually get to work using less gas because there's less traffic. But you, you talk about raising the taxes a penny a gallon. I mean, if a politician were to say that, he, he would get six votes. That's it. He'd be done. You know what I mean? So I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I'm not 100% in favor, but that's something besides. Well, I'll tell you what, though. If we want to develop our economy, 
Our economy needs infrastructure. We need a highly developed transportation system. We need a highly developed, uh, uh, everything needs to be highly developed. Our transportation system for people in this country is really neglected. It really and truly is. All right. Sir, did you have another okay. question? Uh, this is probably the most important thing we ever will discuss. The, do you believe that it's possible to correct any of this without correcting the misuse of derivatives? And you're talking about labor for, for, for value without correcting the ridiculous amount that, that, that people get paid and suck out of the economy <laughs> by destroying corporations, plus the derivatives. Those two things probably are causing half of the economic problem in the entire world. Do you think anything can be done without solving those two problems? Well, I know that derivatives is a multi-trillion dollar worldwide yes. catastrophe waiting to happen. Right. Uh, when that happens, we'll just have to see what happens because it's going to be a mess. And uh, how they sort this out, I, uh, you know, I have no idea. But I will say, before I talked about the, the criminality of some of these investors, and not all the investors, I want to say they're all bad because a lot of them are conscientious and, and very careful with what they invest in and the way they run their business. But as an example, the mattress factory, I think it was Sealy or Beauty Rest, or one of these in North Carolina or something, beautiful factory, making profit, and had assets, no debt, a lot of assets. One of these uh, buyout outfits bought that thing out, borrowed gazillions of dollars in their names, gave all that profit to themselves, and when they left, they left the shell and the place went bankrupt. They all lost their jobs. The factory closed down, all done, because somebody saw an opportunity. And that's, a, that's one of the problems with this here finance capital. If you're a private owner of a company, you can have uh, you can have the company paid for, you can have no debts, so you can run that company good. But if you were to try to sell that company, somebody would look at it and say, hey, man, could I squeeze the money out of that place and be on my way? And that's what happens. So, And that's what these hedge funds do and these uh, certain investors do. They look for these well-financed, uh, companies, so they can actually raid them, the raiders, and they destroy it. They destroy our productive capacity. They just, just for personal gain. Are you in favor? Wait, 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 uh, sir. You have to wait until you are called on. Okay. Now Walter had his hand up before you. Walter, right. do you have a question? Good. If you read uh, Mother Jones magazine, you would have seen an article about how. Mitt Romney and Bain Capital drained all of these companies out before they closed them all down. Like, for instance, over $50 million for a few months of management charges. If he were to be elected President of the United States, do you feel that he would drain this country dry and take care of himself and his friends, and leave the rest of us high and dry? But that's, that's a political question, really, off, not what I'm up here talking about. But, uh, I don't, you know, the, the president's, uh, he can only do, you know, the president is not, the president of this United States is not free to do what he wants. Uh, there's, there's a lot in Washington, like I said, the, the resulting uh, legislation that comes out of Washington is a result of an awful big tug of war between all different types of uh, uh, groups uh, that are, that are tr uh, interests. If, if Mitt Romney were elected president, that would mean that the interests that support him have been, uh, uh, um, what, what would you call it? They won. You know, they, 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 so, and the fruits would go to them because they won the election. They, they won Washington. So, if, and the same thing with uh, uh, Obama. You know, if Obama is reelected, there's, there's certain uh, groups that would, would uh, reap the benefits of his reelection. So, if Mitt Romney was elected, we'll have to wait and see. But I don't think he would. I don't. I'm not going to give a comment on what I think Mitt Romney would do or wouldn't do with, as a president. That's that's the best thing for me to say. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Now we've got some other questions here. Um, all right, sir, you had your hand up. Uh, okay, go ahead. No, I pass. Oh, okay, ma'am. <coughs> What the mayor is doing now to 
in Chicago to lower the debt um, if the country was going bad could Chicago stand or other cities stand on their own because they were not in debt anymore well it, what's going to happen is there's going to be some major bankruptcies coming down the pipe uh, maybe municipalities or states or local governments or counties or sewage systems. There's one in, uh, uh, I can't think of the name of the place, uh, Alabama. The big steel town in Alabama. What's the name of that one? Birmingham. 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 Yeah, that's the uh, sanitary sewer company in Birmingham is about to go bankrupt. But anyhow, we're going to have all these bankruptcies coming down the pipe. Uh, Will Chicago be part of it? I don't know, but my opinion is that the government, like I said before, will have to either decide either bail out the municipalities or the states or bail out the banks that are going to be stung when they go bankrupt. And when that cycle starts, I believe we'll be heading into an inflationary period. And with an inflationary period, the city of Chicago, their debts would be relatively more manageable. Okay. So whether the city of Chicago uh, goes bankrupt first or benefits from the inflation, I don't know. All right, who else has a question? Anybody else? That's it. Okay, wait, John, Don, you have a question. Yes, I think you hit on this a little bit, but we're not raising taxes on gasoline. But the, the, when we don't have inflation now, it's core inflation, and that doesn't cover energy or food. Well, food's going up a lot, but it's not. Well, the, the, the inflation, the official inflation numbers that the government puts out are manipulated, for sure. And they're manipulated for reasons. Uh, they, because if the inflation numbers reach certain points, then the Social Security benefits have to go up. Uh, other benefits have to go up. So they, they manipulate those numbers to keep the inflation number uh, subdued. They, I've seen uh, different things on the internet that show the real inflation level in this country when you consider everything is upwards of 6%. Uh, but like I say, the government has their reasons for keeping, uh, keeping the numbers subdued because like I say, it, it keeps Social Security and all, a lot of other factors under control for them. And politically, you know, if the administration would be foolish to uh, give negative numbers out when they're trying to run run for re-election. So they're going to keep, they have their own reasons for, for trying to put a positive spin on everything. They want to get re-elected. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there anybody else who has a question? Let's go, All right. well, Let's go to rebuttal. Oh, actually, I have one other question. But I like this. <laughs> okay. 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 Now, you've been talking. I, I wanted to ask if you are in favor of, of a gold standard for the United States. And if so, uh, how, how would you implement that? No. Uh, a gold standard, in my opinion, is a myth. And I'll tell you why. Because, well, for one thing, if we were to go on a gold standard, where would we get all the gold? Are we going to confiscate everybody's gold? Is the government going to confiscate everybody's gold so they have the gold to, to back up their currency? And where would they get, even if they confiscated 100% of all the gold in this country from everybody, including pulling it out of your teeth, I don't think they'd have enough gold to cover the currency that they have in circulation. And, and uh, is the United States going to be the only country in the world with the gold standard, or are we going to go on a worldwide gold standard? I don't. I think the gold standard is a myth. That's my own opinion. And we were never on a gold standard. Even Bretton Wood and uh, before then, we were. What we did was we pegged our currency to gold. All we did was peg it. And France showed us. France showed us what a. What a France showed us what a myth it was to be considered on a gold standard because during the Nixon administration, we were running a big trade deficit with France. And what did France do? They gave us our paper money and they demanded gold. Yeah. Well, we were giving them some gold until they realized, hey, they keep this up, they'll have all our gold. You know, we'll just have our scraps of paper money back and they're going to have all our gold. So Nixon closed the gold window. All right. And that was the end of the gold 
facade, the gold standard facade, which we never really was. We were pegged, the currency was pegged to gold. But as soon as you tried to realize that peg, it came unglued. All right. Um, all right, sir. Well, well my question was because earlier in the statement you mentioned the gold, that the currencies in the world are based on the value of gold. Yes. But, you, but you pose the gold standard. Yes. And the reason I say currencies are a representation of gold is because gold is money. All commodities in the world value has to be determined by something. It can't just be dollars and yen and euros and, and who knows, uh, pesos and, and all these other different, it has to have, the currency has to have, all the commodities have to have something to judge their value against. And, the, and, and it has to have a worldwide standard that we can judge the values against. And that worldwide standard is gold. So no. gold is a stand, is a special commodity. That's what money is. A, money is a special commodity that all other commodities value is judged against. That special commodity is either gold and in some respects silver. And we can prove this theory because if you look at the price of gold, it's denominated in every currency in the world. So you can buy, you can buy gold with any currency, you can buy real gold with it. So gold does represent, okay. currency does represent gold. Let's get the rebuttal. All right, go ahead. Well, no, 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 Charlie had a split. Well, Charlie had a split. It's going to be one. In fact, in is fact, it in the, fact wait, wait, the one, one, one fool at a time. Oh, I thought I had a follow up here. No, no, no. Let, 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 uh, I like to hear his follow up as well. Is yeah. that okay? Okay, go ahead. I sir. mean, in the world, the dollar is the default currency. But the, but the U.S. dollar is not based on the value of gold. I understand that it's not based on the value of gold, but if you can exchange something for gold, you understand what I mean? That, that's what gives the dollar its value, its ability to buy commodities, buy gold. It's not that we're on a gold standard, but it, it, you, it, let's take Zimbabwe currency. You can't buy nothing with, you cannot buy gold, you can't buy anything with Zimbabwe currency. It's worthless today. Mm -hmm. So you see, that's completely off the world standard. I'm trying to, the way I, why I say that is not we're pegged to gold or we're on a gold standard, but if you could, if real money is gold, and all currencies represent real money. That's all I'm saying. And to prove it, you can buy, you can exchange currencies for gold and silver, which is real money. That's, all right. that's the equation I give. All right, Charlie, go ahead. Quick one. Isn't is the value of the U.S. dollar based on the value of the United States economy and the organized labor movement that produces wealth? It has nothing to do with some old-fashioned shiny stuff <laughs> I don't quite know how to say that but worldwide worldwide currencies fluctuate against each other and the currency markets based on the underlying economies that they represent and, and so if our economy if, if our economy were to uh, fall apart, and suppose we started to have a high inflation in this country, people would start to lose faith in the dollar based on those issues, and the dollar would plummet in value. So it's it, all currencies are really relative to each other. They're all uh, fiat currencies, and they're all just relative to each other, and and that's in the FX market. What gives? Why? Here's you say. Well, if 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 we're headed down the road towards uh, insolvency in this country, why don't the people who trade currencies understand this and dump dollars? Well, the reason is because the currency markets work on tomorrow, no farther than tomorrow. If I'm a currency trader and I say the U.S. dollar is going to lose 70% of its value in the next six months, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop buying it today because if the U.S. dollar is going to go up relative to other currencies by one-tenth of one percent tomorrow, I'm buying them today. And so that's what keeps it's the value of the relative value of currencies based just on a very short future that keeps the currency market the way it is, not on projections of where we're going farther on down the road. All right, um, all right. Now there's. Okay. Are you going to have a question? Go ahead, Margaret. Um, if, if, as you say that you would you would invest in gold. 
and uh, let's say that the world falls apart, and you have bars of gold in your bathroom, and you want to go buy a dozen eggs at the market, how are you going to do that with a bar of gold? Well, <laughs> there are other, you know, you can, there's a lot of ways you can invest in precious metals. One of the ways is to actually buy the physical metal, or there's a, if you want the internet, there's a lot of investments that invest your money in precious metals. Yeah, but how, how okay. am I going to buy a dozen eggs? That's well, what I want to know. it's the same way you would do today if you had gold. If you didn't have any money and all you had was gold, you'd cash the gold in for money and spend it. But the thing with, with if you have your money invested in precious <coughs> metals, if we have a 10 or 20 percent annual inflation, or even a 10 or 10 percent inflation rate every month, you can you can divvy out that precious metals a little at a time. Here's the other thing: Why do we invest in precious metals to protect us against inflation? Let's suppose an ounce of gold will buy 100 loaves of bread. That ounce of gold, in fact, in biblical times, I think they had a. a, a uh, uh, showing that an ounce of gold in biblical times did buy 100, ounces, 100 loaves of bread. An ounce of gold today still buys that same 100 loaves of bread. So even though the price of gold is skyrocketing, the value of the gold in relationship to other commodities is stable. And, and that's why you want to invest in precious metals if you anticipate inflation because you want to keep, your, you want to keep the value of your investment. Maybe real estate, Maybe agricultural investments. There's a lot of different investments that may prove good in an inflationary period. I don't know what they are, but I'm pretty confident that precious metals and maybe probably some other commodities would be would be a good investment. It's taking ten minutes to tell her how to buy a bus. All right. Uh, All right. Sir, <laughs> Jim, back to my original uh, question, and that is, we went from five trillion of national federal debt. In 2009, we added six trillion to stimulate the economy. Now, why don't we have any kind of political nerve or will to reverse, to reverse our big debt and to start paying it down? During World War II, for instance, we had a marginal tax rate of this country of 98 percent. That meant we we're taking the money from the rich. Okay, we we're taking the money from all the corporations, and it worked. We to hope we were able to tax and pay a lot of our way out of World War II. Why can't we find solutions to get out of this? All right. During the, a lot of people don't realize it, but during like the, the Eisenhower tax administration, you're right. The highest tax bracket was 90 percent during the Eisenhower administration. 90 percent was the highest tax bracket, and they called it at that time. Let's see. Uh, we call it capital gains today, they called it unearned income back then. But anyhow, you're right, the tax bracket was 90%. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of people seem to think that our 120% of GDP is not a devastating uh, crisis in the making. Because they say, well, uh, uh, tax brackets, I think in Europe, are up to 45 or 50%, and our high tax bracket here is like 28%. So we got another 20% cushion that we could. Uh, possibly uh, uh, used to, to prevent a, a currency crisis in this country. Uh, well, here's, I don't know why, you know, that's a political question that it would have to be determined. Why can't we? I don't see any reason why we can't. I don't see any reason why we can't there raise the uh, top tax Walter, 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 you need, let, let the speaker so, speak. I don't, I don't see any reason why we can't raise okay. it. Tax break. It's not going to hurt our economy. They think it will. It won't, because, I like agree. I say, if we tax it, they, the rich don't have no problems in the United States borrowing their money. But if we try to tax it away from them, oh, they got a big problem with that. And I don't see that uh, that a high tax rate on the wealthy will hurt the actual economy of this country. That's my opinion. Okay. All right. Let's have a warm round of applause. <laughs> So, uh, so first of all, whoa, 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 wait, wait, Walter, one fool at a time, okay? Now, now, uh, all right. So first of all, what I would like to see is a uh, is a show of hands, okay? Uh, everybody, now first of all, I just want to explain how the rebuttal thing works. These are the on deck chairs. These chairs that people are sitting in, all you know, 
this is if you want to give a rebuttal, you come and you sit in these chairs and and uh, and then you just kind of play music, move down the line uh, to, from left to the right. Now, uh, I want to know, uh, apart from the people in the chairs, how many people would like to give a rebuttal speech? So everybody wants to give a rebuttal speech. Raise your hand. All right, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, keep your hands up, folks. Eight, nine, ten, uh, eleven. Okay. Uh, you don't get double time for two hands, Bob. Twelve. Thirteen. Okay, and I'm fourteen, and our speaker is fifteen. So that's fifteen people. Uh, 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 sorry, Bernie, not 25 minutes. It's going to be four minutes each. Okay, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to be timing it. So y'all get four minutes. So let's. Uh, okay, go ahead. Okay, sit your or Frank. Frank, go ahead. Of course. All right. I, I want to thank the speaker today because for the first time I saw the logic of explanation of how the. Uh, boom and bust cycles of the capitalist system works. I, I never was able to see it as clearly as so today. Uh, I did know and I suffered the invasion of the United States to my country to sell the shit that they were producing and they couldn't sell in this country. And that's how the United States prevented you for many years falling into these uh, periods of stagnation. But they force their junk into every country in the world, whether by diplomacy or by gun diplomacy. In Argentina, it was by gun diplomacy. They threatened to bombard the city of Buenos Aires and the city of La Plata, where the refineries are, uh, forcing Argentina to keep buying the General Motors and international harvester products. Um, so we, we, we suffer the consequences of this system. Now, uh, I don't think that as a, as a world it is, we cannot continue this uh, system that requires the increase in production, continuously increase in production, to maintain the system working. We are in a finite world with finite resources. But more than anything else is the biological system that is being tampered with. Uh, it is very obvious that the amount of uh, gases that we throw in the, in the air are so tremendous that the mercury that it comes out of the smokestacks of these power plants have contaminated the seas all over the world. Today you cannot eat a big uh, tuna fish without having mercury or lead or other contaminants. They, they grow in the sea in the middle of the ocean and they get contaminated that way. We cannot continue this. This is just impossible. Uh, so if we, if we continue tampering and breaking the biological uh, uh, system to the point that it collapses, then what do we have left? Uh, I don't think we can survive that way. So the acceleration of consumption of fossil fuels, if you look at the, at the curves of <coughs> consumption of fossil fuels uh, in the next 25 years, the, the consumption is doubling to what we're doing today. Now, in order to maintain that consumption, we will have to open up new Saudi Arabia fields every year, every year, every year for the next 25 years. There is no such a thing in the world. So we cannot maintain that. At some point, this has to break down. This, this, this chain is, is, is very strained to beyond uh, the, the strength of the chain. Um, so uh, we are introducing to the environment not only uh, metals like mercury and lead, but also radioactive particles, cesium, plutonium, and all that. This is long-term shit. Uh, the uh, depleted uranium, the uranium-238, has a half-life of four and a half billion years, uranium-238. And we dump in it, we, that, we did dump it in Bosnia, we dump it in Iraq. What are we doing, guys? This is not sustainable. All just to maintain the machine of production going. And what are we doing? We are doing, everybody who knows me for a while, my, my saying is we are making plastic shit. 
this plastic shell of different colors. We are decorating our houses in the walls and always plastic shell. And this plastic shell is entering into the seas by one billion tons a year. One billion tons of plastic shell is entering into the sea every year. This plastic shell produces biological changes when interact with the ultraviolet rays in the sea, and this producing changes on the fish, on the plankton, the phytoplankton. Uh, we kill 40% of the phytoplankton in the Antarctica who produces the oxygen that we need to breathe. And this is not sustainable. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank the speaker. I think he's done a very good job of explaining the uh, economy of the capitalist world. I don't know as much about the economy as I do about uh, dialectics and Marx's ideas. But I'll, uh, I, uh, I, I uh, want to criticize him in one aspect, and that is as far as China is concerned. Now, China calls itself a socialist market economy and is bringing its people out of, uh, out, of, out, of uh, out of dire poverty and it's made progress in only 30 years. It's a very big country, very big, and it takes a long time for it to get out of this uh, mess that it's in because of exploitation of imperialism. That's one of the reasons that uh, we have what they call, that's one of the reasons why we have what they call primitive accumulation in China. Now, primitive accumulation means that you build up a certain amount of capital by hand labor to a large degree, and then you can invest, them, invest it in machinery and other production facilities. And that's what they've been doing in China. That's what they uh, invited uh, other countries in to invest, but they keep a lot of the profits that are made from that. It doesn't all go back to the United States. Uh, they, they have to keep it there to a large degree, and that's why they're growing. They've been growing now for about 30 years and made tremendous progress. And so uh, they, they've invited in uh, companies like uh, Apple, and uh, other companies that have been exploiting the labor of China. And they have to stand for it because it's, that's the only way it could possibly get its economy going. And uh, so uh, Steve Jobs, what he done, he was starving a lot of the uh, people inside, making them work long hours and uh, real, at a real fast pace. And the number of workers there committed suicide as a consequence of that. And a lot of the other uh, corporations that have went in there done the same thing. So it's uh, a type of situation where, uh, where they have to allow that to happen, otherwise they won't develop. And the imperialist countries exploited China for about 100 years. And so China, more or less, is exploiting, ex, ex, you know, people say, well, uh, China is uh, taking away jobs. It's not China that's taking away jobs. It's the United States that is shipping jobs overseas with the help of the government. That's what's actually happening. And once they get there, these corporations get there, they start exploiting the workers. Now the workers are unionizing and pushing these people to the point where they have to raise the wages and make better uh, working conditions. So it's a necessary thing for them to go through this primitive accumulation and have these corporations come in there. But it's moving towards the socialist economy. <laughs> I would like to thank my Marge, my wife, for having the foresight of having three brilliant sons, one of whom is Andrew. Very considerate.
<laughs> With respect to the world economy and the world political situation, the New York Times on the uh, 10th of uh, April had an article on the French election, which is coming up in May and June. First you should know better than that. Uh, there's a fellow named Mélenchon. He's head of a, a party, a new party, which is a, a, a composition of several of the former left countries. A party. He calls it the the left front. Right here. Um, he was a former teacher, a Trotskyist, and a minister in the socialist government. But to give you an idea of what his quote reforms are for capitalism, for French capitalism, uh, he speaks of a civil insurrection, raising the minimum wage 20 percent to 2,200 dollars a month, and confiscating all income above 470 thousand dollars a year and burning prof uh, banning profitable companies from laying off any workers. If you make a profit, you don't lay off anybody. And he says, when there is no more liberty, civil insurrection becomes a sacred duty of the republic. Yeah, I uh, would like to um, commend the, the speaker. I learned quite a bit as far as economics was concerned in certain areas. But um, I'm up here to stipulate that the states control the um, corporations. And you always have a contract. And in a contract is an offer and an acceptance of an offer. When you have the banks as corporations, they're controlled by the states. And the state has a code that they use. The code is basically stating that banks cannot give or loan their assets. So when you understand that, would you allow someone to loan your assets to someone and make a profit off of it? That's where the window of opportunity occurs for the, um, the individuals that want to do some scurious uh, um, activity. I just put it like that. You can check the code, and I've read it a number of times. The issue about uh, the dollar being a, a currency of the, of the world, my understanding is that the, uh, in order for countries to buy oil, they had to purchase it with dollars. And because they purchased it with dollars, that made it the standard. And um, I guess that'd be it. I want to thank the speaker. And I want to thank you, uh, Don, for being a moderator. At least you tried. You did a good job. No, no, no. You did, did a good job. I mean, you tried better than some others. Uh, uh, I'll leave that. Uh, I still can't. The speaker said, I can't uh, make nothing, something out of nothing. I still can't, and I'm not going to spend no time on it, but in that uh, economic book with it, money and banking, they said to pretend and he get uh, 90. I still don't know where the 90 come from. But I'm going to leave that, leave that there and I'm going to move on. And I'm going to move on to something that I didn't have to read about because I was looking at it when it was happening. In the late 90s and in the early 20s, uh, uh, the, the, the policemen, the school teachers, so, hey man, he has a card, I mean, if you need some money, blah, blah, blah. Now, who do you think they're working for? They're working for the bank. They're not working for themselves. Banks was financing a house that was 100000 for 150 The bank was telling the buyer how much the house was, not vice versa. Now, why do you think this was happening? Well, okay, let's move forward a little. Now, when I was in school, the bank had to have reserves, say like $10. When they merge with Wall Street, they don't have to have that now. Now, if they made $90 from 10, guess how much they can make from shit? I mean, from nothing. Now, when last I heard, the Federal Reserve determined the money supply. The government, the Federal Reserve tell the government how much money they need out there. Now, people, the Federal Reserve is a private entity. 
members of 12 banks that are private throughout the United States, 12 banks make up the Federal Reserve. They're in charge, like I said, of printing the money. Now, if you put some kids in the house and say, well, a daddy got to go to work up kids, that's good. Now, don't y'all buy the candy then, and the closet's full with candy. Now, these six and seven year olds, they're going to let you go to work and they going to buy the candy? Well, let's yeah. look at the Federal Reserve. That's all it is. If I can create money, I can create as much as I want. And if ain't nothing backing it, it's creating money out of nothing. And if you think I'm just saying that, why don't you go and ask the president, why did he use the term toxic assets? Toxic asset means some numbers that ain't shit backing it. They're just that simple. Now, ain't nothing about your backing it. But up the F-15s and the black helicopters, they can do a pretty good job backing up some of this shit. <laughs> now, I'm saying that you create money out of nothing. It's obvious to anybody that will live in, in 1999 and 2012. Now, where all this money come from? They was running, I, I, I'm saying, they run running the press seven days a week, 24 hours a day, Real money running off of it. But they ain't got nothing back in it. At least in my days, they had a steel mill. They had uh, making television in the United States. They, and they had laws that said you can only lend this much of money and so forth. But they don't have that no more. The Federal Reserve, our Treasury Department, big cooperation, and Wall Street that done taken over the commercial bank can do anything they want with the value is in Bob the Knot. Uh, thank the speaker for an interesting uh, discussion of economics. Uh, first of all, I'm going to start off by saying that uh, you want to read a fascinating little uh, section on the uh, Germany in 1923 read a force more powerful, there's just one section in there, a force more powerful by Ackerman and Duval. Uh, I think you'll find it, uh, I found it a lot of fun to read that, and it was really a political deal. Um, as far as uh, uh, the speaker's uh, uh, idea of economics, um, I think there's something to be said for an academic study of economics. Um, I myself had a, a, a general economics course in labor economics, but on top of that, and there's something the speaker didn't talk about much, is the value of land, and that it would be covered in the Henry George courses. So I would certainly recommend the Henry George courses. Um, unfortunately, Henry George is a kind of guy that. Uh, one-liners will not do it. It's a pain in the neck because you've got to really listen to all his arguments. But I'll still try to go through them real quick in about a minute or two that I have. Uh, labor is the standard of value. The th three uh, parts of production, uh, elements of production are land, labor, and capital. Uh, the problem is that the land is in a very few hands. You might say, well, I own my house. Yeah, you own your house. I'll figure that on the size of the entire world. The land in, in the world is in very, very few hands. Uh, labor is being exploited. It's a, sim a situation similar to slavery. Uh, this should not have been, but it is. Uh, what is the answer? Well, Henry George would say that land should be owned by the community. And the full rent, the full rent of the land, not the production, not the improvements, should be used for the community, for tax purposes. If you do this, this single tax, you will have a good basis for your tax system, and you will cut down on the booms and busts. Uh, he called them poverty and progress. Uh, but if you use this system, it will cut down on the booms and busts. But don't let this 
little summary uh, prevent you from taking the Henry George courses. I took them in 1999. Very, very valuable. The speaker said there are several points he could spend several hours discussing. I could spend several hours discussing them too in quite a different fashion. Uh, I think the different, well, there's a, a beautiful little essay by Sidney Harris years ago about finding a theology lesson in a, in a novel. He says the distinction between a good novel and a bad novel is that in a good novel the characters have uh, lives of their own and uh, shape the plot to meet their needs. Whereas in a bad novel, they are bent and twisted to the needs of a plot. And unfortunately, economics is generally done here and elsewhere as a bad novel. It's kind of hard to find it. Economics done as a good novel. And we didn't get that tonight either. Not from the speaker and not from the audience either, as far as that goes. But anyway, uh, I got a couple things I want to. Where did all this uh, inflation and uh, currency and everything come from? I made a copy the other day from a book by the Union Head in Chief, <laughs> the guy that employs George Meany. Oh, it's, oh, I guess it was over 15 years ago. He wrote this in 1995, roughly. From 1981 to 1992, the Reagan and Bush administrations took America further down the low-wage path. National policies dampened the growth of employment, encouraged company mergers and downsizing, sent jobs overseas, held down the minimum wage, and strengthened employers at the expense of their employees. Which also could stand several hours of discussion too. But as to what you do about it, what you're going to have to do about it, there was a, a program on, I think it was the National Geographic Channel last week about people pre preparing for doomsday. Whether that be from a, a uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I guess it's going to be a series on Tuesday nights. Uh, it's been on for a while. It's called well, Doomsday Preppers. Right. Yeah, Preppers. Well, anyway, they were... You know, the, the old-fashioned term for this used to be survivalists, but they're figuring out, we're trying to implement ways to survive on their own. And a lot of them have rooms in their house where they can retreat. And uh, they've got knives or whatever to keep strangers from busting in. How long that's going to last, I can't have to wonder, but... Uh, I think we are in for an economic breakdown, a hyperinflation. And the currency isn't worth anything. And I think you need to understand a little more about currency than what was uh, evidenced here tonight. Years ago, I read a saying that uh, there's two pe only two people in the world that understand currency. And they disagree. <laughs> but anyway, the Fort East Coast Railroad, you know, I, you know, it's, you know years of railroads and unions. I don't see too many people doing anything about the Fort East Coast Railroad, but in the 1960s, they took a strike rather than go along with the National Wage Agreement. And uh, it's, instead of writing, Three crews 
from Miami, Jacksonville to Miami. It, it ran one crew and one two-man crew instead of three or more, more or three four-man crews. And what it did with the uh, what it did with uh, the excess profits. You talk about reinvestment becoming costs. They put that into the trick. Okay. All right. Well, listen. And All right. I'm surprised. All right. I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Right. Yeah. You see, you see that? They kind of set the pattern for most of the world industry today. All right, Bill. It's your time's yeah. up. As a matter of fact, you're six minutes yeah. up. Why, why are you worried? God will provide you. Uh, Jesus was a very good manager. Uh, unless uh, his staff and his crew, which were following him, they cannot assure him that uh, will they are going, there will be enough food will be provided for all entourage. If enough food is not provided, he will not go there. Now, think about if our government follows that policy, not to go somewhere where they cannot afford. And uh, our problems are there. We are trying to provide resources for ecologies. We do not have resources for. Uh, I went to we were traveling overseas and uh, somebody told me that uh, what a wall's problem is, assault problem. And he said that a body had a fight that uh, brain says I'm the king and heart says I'm the king and assault says assault is a king. And everybody fighting. You know, finally assault got mad and he shut off. He said nothing will pass through here. The, the problem, problem is that uh, we, we don't have no stop. People want to live 100 years and want to be paid by government to live into problematic. It's unrealistic. You know, I don't, I, I want them to start as six, retired people at 62 and hey, after 70, thank you. If you have resources, you're welcome. If you don't, goodbye. You know, we'll provide you final passage. But, I mean, this, this sounds very cruel, but, but think realistically. If you, if you do not have enough money to pay for delivery person for a pizza you order, you can order that pizza. It's as simple as that. The, we have a, uh, lots of young women, underage, lots of them, making babies. And uh, Catholic Church says, well, you can stop them. I had an argument with a young 15-year-old girl, and she says, it's against my religion to get a person. I say, is it your, against your religion to bang? And, and I say, what your church say about that? See, we, we, unless we lay down a rule that this is the way it's going to work, and this is the way we have resources and we can spend, we cannot survive. You know, we get to tell, we get to tell poor people. The Mother Teresa said a very nice thing. That, that and, and she, she, she spent her life helping poor. They say poor people, what we owe them each. Food and a reasonable shelter, but we do not own them their fancy lifestyle. We do not owe them the everything. We owe them enough so they have to work, so they can get up and go and uplift themselves. But we cannot give them so much that they do not uplift themselves and go and work. I think the German is Angela Merkel. I, I admire their leader. She knows what, what his people are capable of. She manages her government well. Okay? And she is a strong leader. And she tells the truth to his people. Our government, we have a problem. We elected Barack Obama like we were electing Jesus. Yeah. That's stupid. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, if you're going to elect our leader on a that basis, 
I mean, Hillary Clinton was 10 times more qualified than Barack Obama. Okay, the guy, guy, cannot, guy can play good speech, but cannot sit down with the congressional leaders. Do not talk to them. How do you, how do you run a government? You think about LBJ. He'll pick up a phone and say, hey, you know, Martha, what's going on? You know, I need your help. You know, but this guy doesn't, doesn't talk to anybody. He thinks, well, you know, he got elected, he's a big guy, and so everybody's supposed to bow down and say, sir, what can I do for you? You know, for a constitutional lawyer, he had an alternative proposed for a mandate. They were talked about. He did not lead. You know, he should have done what has to be required. We need a good leader. That's our problem. <laughs> Andrew, we very much enjoyed your talk tonight. Very uh, logical uh, approach in, uh, to uh, study of economics. Now, your bio says you're basically a labor guy. Yet your your speech made a hell of a lot of sense. And my question is, how did that happen? Oh, <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, it was, as I said, very straightforward common sense uh, analysis. Uh, you what you did, uh, you know, a lot of professional economists and academic economists just don't seem to be able to do. Uh, I do disagree and agree with you on some specific points, however. Uh, value of commodities is uh, really not so much based on uh, the labor that goes into them, but what they'll be used for. Uh, for example, years ago, whale oil was a very uh, important, valuable commodity, but because it was replaced by something else, kerosene, uh, it became uh, less valuable. And of course, the market <coughs> price relates in some ways to the value, but the market price is, is largely determined about who wants it and how much they want and how many people want it. We've seen a huge increase in commodity prices, everything from scrap metal uh, to fuel uh, to concrete because uh, China in particular, but other nations of the world are starting to become industrialized and they are competing for these commodities. Uh, one of the things I liked, you did point out that uh, what unions do, essentially, is they're selling a commodity, too, just like other companies are. I've always supported the right of unions to, to organize and bargain collectively, but in fact, unions are a, an alternate form of corporation that just basically has an important commodity to sell. Uh, I 1,000% agree with you on increasing the income taxes, and uh, the people on the right are going to fight this until the end eventually. I think they're, they're going to lose, but I don't think they're going to lose badly enough. I've talked here about uh, uh, taxation, income taxation in particular. One of the things we need to do is get rid of the regressive taxes, uh, particularly sales taxes, okay, and the payroll tax. The payroll tax is, is almost an evil tax because it, it taxes people from dollar one, but then you get up to a higher level, it stops so the, so the wealthiest pay much less payroll tax. Uh, we need to uh, fund Social Security out of general revenues uh, and, and a progressive income tax that is substantially increased to cover the services that people need. We don't need to be closing our libraries and closing mental health clinics and all the other things we're doing. Those are local examples, but they're national examples uh, as well. Uh, the other thing, and I've had a change of part of this recently, uh, lowering corporate taxes, I agree with that because we are competing in a world market and uh, so we don't want to put our corporations at a disadvantage. They don't uh, pay give them an advantage if possible in competing in, in the world. Inheritance tax should be increased substantially, uh, in my opinion. And I would favor, and I, I don't have a lot of support on this, but a single national system uh, for taxation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I would get rid of uh, the, the, the value of a national system as we get rid of competition between jurisdictions uh, where uh, companies will go to different jurisdictions and therefore, uh, uh, you know, take money away from the taxing bodies and, and give it back to the corporations 
and I think I see a zombie approaching me here on my left. Uh, briefly disagree with, uh, agree and disagree with Henry George. Yes, uh, net worth taxes, including property, are an important part of our tax system, uh, but uh, not should not be the sole part of it. Thank you. I hope I didn't miss any Henry George discussion while I was in the band. I heard uh, somebody mention Henry George. But anyway, uh, well, thanks, Andrew, for giving it a shot here tonight. Uh, quite a bit of what you said is, you know, is, there's problems with, you know, errors with. Um, value of things is really set by uh, the person that's going to buy them, what they think that's going to save them in labor. That's price. And, uh, you know, now price is, you know, so there's supply and demand comes in there too. But uh, anyway, this, I would recommend taking uh, Progress in Poverty over at Henry George School to get a good foundation in, in things like that and, and uh, the difference between wealth and capital and, and money and, uh, and that kind of thing. It's classical political economy. Um, the solution to our problem? I've mentioned it here many times. There is a silver bullet. As a matter of fact, there's a book called Silver Bullet written by an economist from England named Fred Harrison. And the silver bullet is uh, taxing location values. People, or in other words, land values. People always talk about property and they always want to lump the house in with the land. And what, what caused this depression that we're in right now is not a business, this is not a business cycle depression. This is a land bubble depression. We've had many, many times over. Now there are business cycles and things that have a little minor. Those are little minor fluctuations. These these big nasty ones are, uh, you know, asset bubble things. Usually real estate. And matter of fact, before the 1929 crash of the stock market, that was preceded by a real estate uh, speculative bubble. And uh, so what happened here? Again, you know, land is a fixed item. Uh, we are a nation of real estate speculators. Everybody wants money for nothing. They want to buy that little piece of land and then sit on it for 30 years and cash out and make millions of dollars without having to work for it. And, uh, you know, largely you can kind of get, you know, usually that works. You know, usually, you should, usually you can get away with that. But occasionally, though, this comes to the top like it happened this time and then it, it crashes. The, 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 the growth is always slow, but the crash is always immediate. Uh, so anyway, Henry George studied this problem and wrote his book Progress and Poverty back in 1879 and wondered why do we keep having, why do we still have poverty in the midst of all this modern uh, you know, production and everything we had? And it's because of the fact that rent always goes up. In other words, land's a fixed price, so land value always goes up. And labor and capital only keep what's left after the rent has been paid. So in other words, here's the, here's the deal, folks. It's, we're paying income taxes and sales taxes because what should be going to the government treasury, and it's not, is the location value or the ground rent on, on land. It should be our, all of our, you know, we should all own the land in common. So when you look at a, a storefront over on Chicago Avenue near State Street, storefront over there is $6,000 a month. Now you know that it did not cost $6,000 a month. You know, it's not worth that for that building. It's the replacement cost of that building is not that kind of money. It's probably only about a thousand or fifteen hundred. The other three, four thousand dollars is going into some landlord's pocket every month. Unearned income, right? And he's just making money on the value of the land and the value of the land keeps going up. And so what we need to do is just like we just like we took slave we made slavery illegal illegal, we didn't reimburse the slave owners for their slaves. The same thing with land, it's this fixed value. You know, if land taxes were high enough, land would have no resale value. Land would be zero, and you would just buy the building. You could own a building, but the land would be zero, and you would pay a monthly rent to the government, or yearly rent, for the exclusive use of that land. And there would there, there be no sales taxes then, and no income taxes. There's your economic boom. That's the silver bullet. That's the way out of this problem. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Oh, zero. All right, Margaret. Okay, well, I, I will, of course, deviate a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think uh, people yeah, so. who uh, feel that you, you can... Yeah, okay. 
I can't even think when you're not talking. What do you think when you are talking? Anyway, um, because it's late and um, and I'm not. This is not my hour. Um, I, I think I, you know. I see people hoarding things and getting into a, a fortress somewhere, and then the the 99 percent, if I may borrow something from Occupy Chicago, is starving in the streets. And how long do you think the one percent is going to stay behind the castle walls? It's not going to be long because they're going to be dragged out and the castle walls are going to be torn down. So um, I think that the, the people who have all, all, all the money, or at least a vast amount of it, really need to keep that in mind. They benefit from our tax dollars because we pay for roads and for uh, the, the, the infrastructure by our taxes and our labor. And so, you know, they're they're acting like, you know, that that they earned all their money themselves. And don't ask me why someone is worth a million bucks an hour or whatever it is that we're paying CEOs. The second thing I would like to take exception to, uh, well, well, besides just dumping all the poor people in in a in a hole in the ground someplace, um, is is the babies that we're all creating. In fact, our um, teenage uh, pregnancy rate has gone down considerably in the last uh, few, in the last year or in the last five years, number one. But number two, regardless of that, we have the highest um, unplanned pregnancy rate and we have the highest teenage pregnancy rate in this country of any other country in the world, including the countries where the government pays for women to have abortions and all that other stuff. So that uh, where where we have to pay three or four hundred bucks to go have an abortion, um, and and we still have the highest abortion rate. So um, and also I would like to remind people that I th it may have been Christopher Hitchens wrote a book about Mother Teresa called the Missionary Position, <laughs> <laughs> and it's true she sat on millions of dollars of donations and did not provide pain medication for people who were in her hospitals who had bone cancer and things that were extraordinarily painful. They died in pain and she was sitting on millions of dollars <coughs> of donated money. So I don't have a very high opinion of her um, and, and of course the Catholic Church is putting her for sainthood because of her political reasons obviously. And so, um, you know, uh, it, it, yeah, the world is full of uh, it, it question uh, assumptions, I guess. Most of you already know my position on the free market. The missionary one? Well, you know, Frank, you kind of bring that up because tonight I have a feeling I've got to be a missionary. A missionary for capitalism. I love capitalism. And there's one reason why. It's a system that for 300 years has been delivering the goods. I look at all you guys around you here. You're all dressed. You're all clean. You all got took showers this morning. You all were maybe either came by public transportation or by automobile. 300 years ago, you would have been considered the rich one percenters. And the one thing that I have to tell you guys is that because of the advancements of machines, of labor capital, and of the development of technology, we're much better off. The greatest invention of the world was a stock market, the revenue bond, and most recently the venture capital. And the one thing that you have to realize is that one of the reasons that Europe's being held behind right now is they don't let people go into bankruptcy that quick. If you're an old established firm, you can't go bankrupt. You can't let the new innovative firms hire, and you can't get rid of the old hires. Now, you think I'm crazy? Well, ask Thomas Friedman, because a third of the world has just entered the middle class in the last 15 years. We're starting to develop a worldwide economy. Yes, we're having a problem right now because of a credit crunch. What? Because of that credit crunch was based on fraud. Fraudulent transactions based by bankers making loans to people who were not credit worthy. That's called fraud. And what does it mean? When you have fraud, trust goes down. What you need is a good, solid, highly regulated market where perhaps bringing back Glass-Steagall 
and everything else. Now, let's address the Republicans, for example. Those clowns in the office right now are saying that we can pay for everything and do everything, and we're hearing the same arguments that Newt Gingrich brought forth in 1994. Guess what happened when they got into power? Two wars that were not really needed to be fought, and an explosion in our national debt because of the taxation. It's very simple. You want money to get back into the economy, you raise the tax rates. It's called simple. Let the Bush tax cuts expire. Now, you have, if you want government, you got to pay the piper and pay the rent. If you want good health care, you got to pay the rent and pay the taxes to maintain the benefits. If you want a good economy and a good capitalistic system, you got to have a good, highly trustworthy market that's got some reasonable regulations on it. The derivatives market right now is highly unregulated. That's why we're having trouble. When you have a good stock market that's regulated, it works. Free markets have been working for millions, for not millions, but hundreds of years. Ever since the start of the coffee houses in uh, London and the Lloyds of London insurance firms and many things else in the stock market development of tulip, uh, the tulip bubble, we've been seeing it for years. Yes, capitalism works. If you don't believe me, just take a look at the clothes on your back. Take a look at the benefits we have in a modern industrial economy and take a look and what happens? Sure, we may have a boom bus cycle. Don't you take but a look all, at an unemployment wait, wait, office. I have taken a look at an unemployment office, Charlie, and those unemployed usually drive to them. They don't walk. <laughs> and the second thing you got to realize, Charlie, is you're a government employee, and you wouldn't even have your salary without the benefits and taxation of oh. modern corporations. Oh. Oh. You know, and the one thing you have to realize is that capitalism is a trustworthy system. And if you don't believe me, it's called a contract. You have to trust a party, and it usually helps a lot. If you're trading, you're not fighting. And if you're trading, you're talking. And this story. Thank you.
they were eliminated uh, from uh, uh, their position in society and had to sink into the working class. Uh, well, uh, uh, a, uh, another previous speaker uh, talked about uh, China. Uh, China is a capitalist society. It's a state capitalist society. Uh, you know, where the state or, or <laughs> the community owns the property and uh, particularly the means of production, you, know, you have uh, a, a, the, the state capitalism. Uh, and uh, Basically, what the Chinese need is a socialist revolution. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker. It was really, really good. All right. I can't say I can thank all the rebutters. I'll be very quick. And, and, and um, the speaker began by talking about surplus value. And my understanding of this is if you go to work for eight hours a day, uh, only a certain period of that day is spent paying for your salary for the eight hours. Meaning, after you work, and the figures that I'm giving, you can choose any one you want. I, but the one I've generally heard is about three-fifths of the day uh, pays for your, your salary. You earn it through your labor. Labor produces all wealth. And the remaining 40% is the money that Tim, your capitalist, keeps for himself. And he reinvests it in other companies. And, yeah. yeah, he's got all uh, sorts of uh, mental constructs and why he is entitled to retain this 40%. Correct. Now, it, it appears, and I don't think anyone will dispute this, that they, what have they done with that 40%? Um, they didn't want the government to take it, so they enacted laws to prohibit that. And what did they do with the 40%? If anything, they kept it for themselves. Or else they engaged, as you just told us, sir, in fraud. Now, if anything we learn is that and this is reflected as well in the demographics. Anyone who's aware of this knows, I've spoken many, many times of this, the 1 to 10 percent do in fact not only own 40 percent, but significantly more than that. I think the figure is as high as 90 percent of the wealth. And this is skewed. The demographics is entirely wrong. Now, to look for them to correct this feature, I think is illusionary. And it won't happen. Um, and by the way, the only reason there's been an increase in the standard of living is because the working people of a nation produce the goods, not because of these 40 percenters or 90 percenters or 1 percenters. They did absolutely nothing. If I'm going to build a railroad, I'm going to need some men willing to pick up and, and build it. Yes. Those are the men that are going to be enable us to ride on the choo-choo train. Uh, not anyone else, not, not some economists and things like this. If anything, these fraud, these guys are guilty of fraud. Now, what are we going to do? We're saying you needed money. Yeah, actually, theoretically, if you take your argument, Andy, I wouldn't be able to buy anything because I'm only earning 60% of what I'm manufacturing. Um, so that's what I mean, some of the theoretics of eco economics you've got to be cautious with because theoretically I'll never be able to buy anything because I'm never going to catch up the whole, the whole day. So what do we do? Well, it's very simple and I, I, I like this individual. I've read his book. Uh, um, Louis Sutton wrote a book. He said, they, they asked him, he's a bank robber. And they asked Willie, they said, why do you rob banks? He said, well, that's where the money is. <laughs> and I say, if we need money, why don't we go to where the money is? And why don't we simply take from the rich and give to the poor? They, they weren't deserving and merited it in the first place, and they have used it. They've not used it for the public good and in the public interest. And the longer we continue this, 
I, I don't see any purpose of this. And I've got to rebut Bill here. Most of his stuff is okay. It's kind of interesting. But he gave an example of a company here, the Florida East Coast, where they took the workforce and they cut it by 75%. And I don't understand that solution whatsoever. Why should I? This is the solution that I have to do to work of like three or four people. This is going to be, this is a solution to the economy. I leave one on Monday, I want you all to do the work of three or four people. It reminds me of when I worked in publishing. I worked for the Doubleday Company. And I was talking to Mr. Doubleday. And I said, I don't mind working for your company. It's very nice. But, sir, I'm not going to do a double day's work for a single day's pay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh yeah, okay. Uh, great speaker and great topic. I just have um, Into the microphone. a few points of uh, information. Uh, there was a young man from the uh, young economist from the University of Chicago <coughs> on PBS the other day, and uh, he was talking about Wall Street and uh, Wall Street, and he was saying one of the problems that we have there is that the young traders come up with new instrument. <clears throat> new financial instruments, and then if they work and if they bring uh, quick results, good results, then you know they share this, inf this information. And everybody does that, and it creates a false capital. And he said, um, whenever we come up, um, someone in a lab comes up with a new vaccine, it has to be tested on a number of people, a number of animals, and for a certain amount of time before that vaccine can be used with the public. Uh, any new tools that we create, we have to test it first for a long time and with a number of people. And if it works, then we can sell it, we can use it. And the same thing should be done uh, with the traders. Whenever somebody comes up with a new fi uh, financial instrument, it should be tested. <coughs> And, uh, and then, if it works well and for a good amount of time, then it should be adopted. So he was um, advocating for an agency that will supervise um, movements and uh, creations of these traders. And I thought that was a good point, and I did not hear it here. But it certainly creates, he, he said he was comparing Wall Street to a casino, period. Uh, and I think that's really what we have seen. Um, you know, I don't know if you have seen the movie Inside Job, where they interview um, Wall Street traders, and it's absolutely incredible what's going on in there, and the fraud and the corruption. Yeah. And, uh, if you have not seen this movie Inside Job, it's <laughs> on the DVD now, and you know, Wait. take a look. Um, Let me start. We are not prepared or so, and this is going to create a crisis <coughs> and gravitate um, the, the present cra uh, crisis, financial crisis, with a tremendous amount of baby boomers who are now going to enter social security, Medicare, and we are not prepared in terms of housing to give them, you know, uh, what they need. And this is happening, uh, right, you know, it's about to happen. And um, the point about Angela Merkel in Europe and what's going on in Europe, it's, um, it, it's not a rosy over there. Um, I was listening, um, I have a French uh, channel at home, and I listened to their interviews. And um, I heard, for example, that Angela Merkel and Sarkozy are the European couple by excellence. But they do make all the decisions, just these two, these two consulting with each other, and they do not consult with uh, leaders of um, Spain, Portugal, Greece, and the southern uh, countries. So there is a great amount of frictions and misunderstanding between the northern European countries and the southern uh, countries. Um, so that, that, that is, so decisions are not made by consensus. And um, Angela Merkel, these two, uh, came up with a policy now in the future so that everybody get more or less the same policies with uh, their IRS and taxes. Um, but um, 
what they have done with Greece, I feel, is, has been extremely painful and cruel for the Greeks. <coughs> and um, I feel that the pain should have been shared and that it should have been <coughs> more humanistic towards them. Okay, no, go ahead. No, let's, I'll yeah. just thank you. I just want to um, uh, talk about a Japanese American uh, cosmologist. I think his name is uh, Kako or something like that. Michio Kako. Michio Kako, yeah. And he's from New York City College. And he was talking about nanoscience. And he said maybe in about, uh, let's say, a hundred years from now, it's going to be very practical to send up narrow, uh, nano robots to different planets and to mine these planets for uh, raw materials and minerals and things of that nature. Because if you look at the uh, spectrum of light that they could take from, from the different planets, we see they got the same raw materials and the same minerals that we have. And he, th he says he's going to send out, they'll send out thousands of these nano robots and they'll be able to mine them. Some won't come back and some will come back. And that's how we're able to uh, live on the earth with raw materials. Okay. Well, oh, all right. 45 seconds. You keep 45 seconds. That's all I need. Okay. okay. I want everybody to notice here there were about 54 people here tonight. Hey, wait. Walter, let him talk. We can replace you in a nano room. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Hey, let the speaker talk. Come on. Hey, go ahead. Walter. You want to come up here and sit in one of these chairs? I'm telling him to let you speak. I'm telling Walter. I'm Walter sticking up for you. All right. Okay, there were 54 people here tonight, right? Nobody else counted besides me. Did anybody notice there were only 12 women? Yes. Yes. Stay in church. Okay. I am not. <laughs> so, yes. so women were proportionately underrepresented here tonight. They were home with the but in terms of their degree of involvement, they were overrepresented. So I'm saying that you know women are getting are poised to take over the world. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to solve the problem with the world's economy, you know, while you guys are married, you just know all you have to do is turn all your money over your way. We got wait, wait, what's up? What's going on, Frank? Well, um, I'll tell you what. Yeah, time, wait, wait, Paul, Wesley, did you want to give? Did you want to say something else or no? Well, I can wait till okay. Time. What I you don't you don't want to? Okay, but I mean, once once we get this to eleven o'clock, it. it's over. I know. Okay. I, I, what I can say. Nano robots. Okay, fine. Oh, go ahead, Frank. Um, the other night, I hear uh, some people from Spain yeah, yeah. send me jokes, and uh, I I went to bed after Margaret was going to. Uh, was sleeping already because she got to work very early in the morning and so I went to bed and I keep waking her up because I start laughing remember the joke I couldn't fall asleep and so the joke was that this seven-year-old kid is, is, uh, is in his bedroom and he's hearing noises and then he, he gets disturbed and so he starts looking and he sees that the noise is coming from their parents. How to use this? Yeah. Time me. And so he just yeah. peeked in there right. and he said, my mother is really bad to me. She's forcing me to go to the psychiatrist because I suck my thumb. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. No, it, it, it didn't hit the market. All right. You guys. All right. All right. This is a real. All right. This is a real interesting presentation. You know, like you're like uh, most of them are. Yeah. Well, let's have a good round of applause. All right, now. All right, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, now, first of all, some of you may have noticed my t shirt, which I wore because I felt it would be appropriate for the topic tonight. Bankers of the World Unite. Not bankers. Yeah, that's right, it's not workers of the world unite. It's bankers. No, it's bankers of the world unite. Put something funny on the back. Right, with the, with the hammer and sickle. So you understand, 
Um, you understand, of course, the, the message of the, this t-shirt was made by the Sharpenberg Gallery back in 2008, back in the Bush era, but during, at the time of the um, bank, the Sharpenberg Gallery, by the way, is up at Lawrence, is in Donk House up at Lawrence and, and, and Western. Uh, and the t-shirt, of course, is, is about the bank bailout of 2008. Uh, that was Bush's bank bailout. And um, what the message, of course, is that the, 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 we, need, we need to have socialism uh, for the banks. We need to have, you know, you know, from each according to his ability, for, that is from the government, to each according to his need. That is the poor suffering bankers with all the financial burdens that they have to bear. They're so they, they need our help so much that we, the taxpayers, must must do everything we can to support these billionaires. All right, so um, so now, so you could probably tell from my shirt that, now I admit I'm not an expert on economics, but as you can see, I'm anything but neutral on the topic. <laughs> so um, now, first of all, I, 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 I like the presentation tonight, and, and I did think it was, um, uh, but I, I have a few disagreements. Like Charlie, I'm gonna be eclectic and skip around a bit. Uh, first thing I wanted to say is that um, I, I disagree with the speaker's concept of exchange. I don't think it's about where if I work eight hours to make a pair of shoes, I want some guy that worked eight hours to, to dig oysters in exchange or something. Uh, I think it's, uh, I don't care how many hours he worked. What, what I want, and, and I actually am a self-employed uh, entrepreneur, and what I want in exchange for, for my, my services or work or what I provide is that um, I expect a fair compensation. In other words, I expect to to be to be compensated for the for the cost of materials, uh, plus the amount of labor I put in, which I could have earned uh, by working for somebody else if I hadn't worked for that person. So that so I would, and I think that's what pretty much everybody is looking for, or every business. Uh, so I uh, now second point I would just want to make. Uh, now you talked about uh, the possibility. You were talking about how to weather the coming economic crisis, which I don't know whether there's going to be an economic crisis or not. But um, uh, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, a couple of things. You mentioned gold and real estate. Now, on the subject of gold, um, you, you talked about the value of gold as being fixed. I would, um, I would actually argue that it fluctuates like any, everything else based on its availability. If the government starts uh, taking gold away and, and stockpiling it, as you were talking about, then... Um, then you know obviously there will be less gold and it'll be more rare and more valuable. On the other hand, or if they, we start running out of it, same thing. On the other hand, if we start mining more gold and suddenly there's more in circulation, it's you know that's going to cause the value to go down. Now, uh, now it's, it, you, I asked you about the gold standard, and you, um, you you just although you argued that money that gold is real money, you said you were against a gold standard. You didn't consider Bretton Woods to be a real gold standard. I would argue that's one form of gold standard, and uh, I think other people would interpret it. There are different ways to do it. I mean, there was also the system that the U.S. had before uh, Franklin Roosevelt became president. And now, as far as the people who advocate the gold standard, such as Ron Paul, he wouldn't advocate what, what you were talking about, taking everybody's private stash of gold away from. Ron Paul is a libertarian, certainly. He, he's for the gold standard, but he wouldn't call for that. Now, in terms of invest, the idea of investing in real estate, well, you had that bubble. Am I out of time? Okay. All right. All right. Well, I just want to say that we had a big bunch of people investing in real estate last decade, and look what happened to them. All right. So that's it. Yeah. Last word, sir. He a pain in the asshole. What? No, thanks. But I just like to say one thing about gold. The, pr the price and the value of gold fluctuates like the price and the value of all commodities. But gold is a commodity that the value of the other commodities is judged against. So I didn't say that the price of gold was fixed. But uh, I, I also want uh, like to uh, thank all my <coughs> critics and, uh, and uh, all ladies and gentlemen who, who criticized me and, and, and uh, rebutted my... Uh, theories, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you for a very warm reception. I appreciate it. Thank you.